wake up to this. Come on now, wake up. I can't wait to wake up. Wake up, idiot. Well, I can tell you what, I'm sure Purdue fans, they're up and they're ready to talk about their team. Wow, what a weekend. College basketball, a little bit of Pacers last night, bunch of nonsense uh, in between, and you got us here for the next three hours. He's Kevin Bowen. I'm Andy Sweeney. We have Corbin with us today. I mean, Corbin, we're talking about the hills of Tennessee before KB walked in. So, well, I'm sad I missed <laughs> does, that to does, lead off. I'm sure you missed that Fill conversation. The break, we will. Uh, we're the wake-up call. We got you for the next three hours here. Uh, on the fan, 93.5, 107.5, the fan. You can watch us on the YouTube stream. You can find us, stream us wherever you do so, and on 107.5, thefan.com. KB, a good morning to you. Purdue marches on, and we will talk about it here Purdue all week. Purdue marches on, and I thought checked several boxes. It would, we're just important on opening weekend. The challenge will be much stiffer coming up in Detroit. Friday night, 7.39, for those that missed it, announced late last night. No worries about fans not getting into the building on Friday night like they had this past Friday at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. Well, you called that one. You uh, said it was going to happen. Uh, it is chaos every year, and the NCAA operates like that at, at a region. But, yeah, 7.39 coming up Friday. Gonzaga, four-and-a-half-point favorite early on. Uh, Andy, I said to you on Friday, mentally, I don't know how to exactly evaluate it, but I'll let you know on Monday. Well, I think mentally they handled opening weekend pretty darn well. Physically, for me, it was, okay, how does Braden Smith look? And I know maybe the stats don't back it up, but I thought he looked back to his normal self. And so exiting opening round weekend, for me, those were the two things. And I'd throw this on there. I'd say the cherry on top, I mean, you got quality minutes from Trey Kaufman Wren yesterday, and he was not very good in the first half Friday. All of a sudden, Matt Painter changes his rotation going into the tournament. He says, Miles Colvin, yeah. Cam Heidi, yeah. you're going to play yeah. a good amount. Yeah, it's not going to be it's Ethan unbelievable. Morton. It's not going to be Caleb first. And those two guys bringing athleticism and shooting, they added something to Purdue. So, uh, obviously, the win speaks for itself. Just the surgical nature to it yesterday. But still, I think a lot of important boxes Purdue checked. Uh, entering the Sweet 16. Yeah, I mean, just what a weekend. And we'll talk about it. Rob Blackman will join us coming up at 9 o'clock. You know, we sat here. Corbin, you'll love this. We sat here, and we did the thing that everyone does. We we, we made sure you knew as a listener how smart we were by all the upset picks we were going to take. And this just happened to be the year that it was chalk upon chalk, which is kind of funny. You know, we're picking all the upsets and all the 10 and 11 seeds and everything else are falling by the wayside. But, you know, listen, I, I thought the Grambling game, I never felt like, Going back to Friday night, KB, I never felt like, you know, Purdue was ever in any sort of trouble in that game. I mean, I know it's close early, and they were going to win the game, and they pull away, and they win, and they cover. They had the, the miracle cover at the end of the game. Uh, but I kind of gave that one maybe like a B, B minus. I thought they were fine. I thought they were acceptable on Friday. But that's not the Purdue that we got yesterday afternoon in Gamebridge. I mean, they broke Utah State's soul in that game. I mean, Utah State was down in the final three, four minutes of the first half, and I tweeted this out. I mean, especially, I was thinking, how are they going to play the final 20 minutes of this game? That coach had to know they were DOA when they got in to that locker room. Utah State had nothing. I mean, they win the final eight minutes of that half. Purdue put them away, and they buried them. Without they, Braden Smith on and, the floor. And 100%. And they didn't let them ever come back. I mean, you see that so much in the tournament. Ah, you get up 12, and then boom. In a second, it's a three- or a four-point game. That was not the case. Purdue put the foot on the throat and ended things rather early. And that was a – I mean, that was almost like the second half was a party atmosphere for Purdue fans inside of Gamebridge. I didn't think it was going to be that. So yesterday, boy, I tell you, yesterday, they were one of the more impressive teams of the tournament, and you put both games together probably of the entire weekend of the NCAA tournament. Yeah, the 39-point margin for Purdue yesterday is the fourth biggest in the history of the tournament for round two games. 39-point margin, fourth biggest in the history period of the entire NCAA tournament. In the second round, the 106 for Purdue is the most they've ever scored in a tournament game. That would be 80 of those games. Um, you know, Andy, it, it's arguably Purdue's greatest weapon, and certainly how it looks this weekend will be a huge, huge factor. 
but it was very apparent. And boy, pray for the Grambling big men. Pray for the Utah State big men. It, it, it's such an earned thing that they can get to the bonus midway through the first yeah. half. Yeah. I mean, what it, was it? The nine minute mark? They were in the one and one it, in both yeah, of these like games that. because you know I, I don't want to sound like I'm nitpicking, but it's just the reality. You know, Grambling State and Utah State, they hung in there for about 10-ish minutes. Utah State much more than than Grambling, of course. Um, but when, you know, Braden Smith is having a little bit of a struggle, um, it was a little clunky for Purdue out of the gate for the first 10 minutes or so yesterday. You know, Trey Kaufman Renz just kind of hitting the glass, and that's where Purdue is getting those, those first six or eight points there. And then all of a sudden, with Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith, I looked at the box score during a media timeout, Andy, at one point, they were one for 11. Those <laughs> it's unbelievable. Three. Yeah. So your three starting guards are one for 11, and Purdue's up 12. Yeah, it's like, done. That is what they have with the ability, again, to get to the foul line. And, and I want to emphasize, it is a earned weapon because the big guys are so skilled. Purdue is so committed to getting them the ball. And teams just feel like they can't single team, in particular Edie, of course. And that is why, all of a sudden, Utah State's turning to dudes that they never thought would even get in the game. Yesterday afternoon, I do think, and this will be a storyline all week long. Um, I, I, I don't know if I want to like carry the water for the other teams in the Midwest region. I do think that the bracket is much, much tougher than a lot of people want to point to now here coming up well, this weekend in Detroit. You've got four of the top 12 teams in Ken Palm in the entire nation. And I think something about seeing Gonzaga coming up Friday and maybe even Tennessee on Sunday. Is there any sort of we've seen Edie before? And you just don't have the culture shock that maybe was there for Utah State. I know it was four and a half months ago, but does that help Gonzaga at all? I mean, hell, Gonzaga saw him last year, and they still have a couple starters back from last year's team. Um, and Gonzaga did have a halftime lead on Purdue in that game in Maui. Now, granted, again, that was a long time ago. Neither team could throw it in the fitting because it was in Maui. They Neither team could throw it in the ocean in that game, uh, you know, back there in the opening round of the Maui tournament. But that is a question that, you know, obviously we can get to all week long. But still, uh, surgical by Purdue. And again, yesterday, Andy, to build that lead without Braden Smith. You go back to Friday night, the not, I mean, it was Edie and, and, and Braden all first half, really, in building that lead. To take that, you know, whatever, one point deficit, and all of a sudden you're up, what was it, 16 and a half, 14 and a half, something like that. And then in full control with Braden Smith on the bench, that's huge. Yeah, and again, we'll, we'll listen. This is going to be all week. Uh, I, I something I want to get into in the seven thirty segment that I actually disagree with. And you know what, Zach Eady agrees with me. Uh, some of the, and I think even Greg Doyle wrote about it. Are the ghosts gone as it pertains to Purdue? I kind of want to kick back on that because I'm not sure uh, that that's actually the truth. But they had as good of a weekend as anybody could have. And you mentioned, and listen, here's where I was probably, and it's funny that it's on the Purdue side, KB, where I was most wrong in my bracket besides, well, no, it's it's in that exact uh, pod, is the Midwest. I was, I, I mean, I, I sat up here and we waxed poetically about McNeese State. By the way, Will Wade interviewing for the Louisville job, which is just unbelievably Ooh. perfectly <laughs> awesome. Uh, it just, it, it really is I think awesome. I like that for Louisville. Uh, I think they're absolutely made for each other. That's what I think. And I like <laughs> Will Wade a great deal. But we sat up here and we act like we knew everything about McNeese State. And I'm not saying I did. That's what the NCAA tournament's for. A team you haven't seen very much, but you've seen the mid, you've seen the the power school, if you will. You think, okay, here's where an upset is, is going to happen. So whether it be Gonzaga in the 512 with McNeese, I will say I uh, I was right about Kansas, but that's a, that's an entirely different thing. But Tennessee, uh, and you know, I, I didn't think Tennessee would be here. Now I had Creighton making it with Purdue uh, to the Elite Eight, so that my matchup is still there. But it's just funny that I feel like I was so bombastic about McNeese State and Tennessee. You know, Tennessee, well, you know, they'll trip up somewhere, and both of those teams, you know, Tennessee gets through to the weekend, and then you mention it. I mean, one, two, three, and five going to be in Detroit. That's as good as it gets. Yeah, it, it is really the, is. Uh, again, four of the top 12 teams, if you look at the Ken Palm rankings, you know, obviously a ton of chalk throughout the Sweet 16 so far, but still that Midwest region, which will be Friday night, again, 739 Purdue tipping against Gonzaga, has got some really, really quality. Uh, last year at this time, Andy, before any 
IU fan even turned on their computer to start their workday before they even <laughs> opened up the email. They deviated around their respective office buildings and they found their <laughs> Purdue coworkers, right? They made sure oh, man. on well, this I'm Monday sure they did. after that- Fairleigh Dickinson, they made sure that before anything got started <laughs> business wise, <laughs> that they made a beeline to those respective cubes around America, or I should say around the state. The awful quiet uh, this. It, it might not have the same sort of feeling, but it is five Sweet 16s and seven tournaments. You got to go back 30 years for Indiana to celebrate five Sweet 16s. <laughs> I was like, so, what are you going to do to kick an IU just, fan any more than the? I mean, come on. They're building around Trey Galloway and Anthony Lee. Purdue fans deserve <laughs> something, you know, after what they had to deal with on this Monday God. last year. That's a little bit of something there. It, it, it's just live in the present for a moment. That is a hell of a run. And Gonzaga with nine straight Sweet 16s sure. is incredible. The opponent they're going to face on Friday, but still uh, quite impressive what Purdue has done. And now they will see if they can really stamp it and head to Phoenix here coming up this weekend. Yeah, for the most part, pretty chalky. Honestly, Andy, you really needed to stay up late Saturday, Sunday, I think, to get the best respective games of the weekend. I I could not. I finally bailed after overtime one. In Creighton, Oregon. Okay. I, I just I, I was wondering. It was twelve fifteen. I'm like, I swear one of these kids are gonna wake up in like two hours, just go to bed. But last night I did make it through all of Houston, Texas A and M. No, you didn't. That was our first buzzer beater of the tournament. Wow, you made it all the way. Good for you. I had to catch the end this morning. Texas A and M forcing overtime in that one. Houston had four dudes foul out. At one point, Kelvin Sampson's turning to a walk on to put in the game. His name is Ryan Elvin. And as fate would have it, as Houston's trying to break the press, the only guy open is Mr. Elvin. Is Ryan Elvin. And he gets fouled. So here he is, up three, Houston. And here's Elvin going to the line. And, I mean, this dude, he looked like, I mean, it was every Houston player is trying to hug him, trying to offer some sort of encouragement. That first free throw caught a lot of iron there, but he did hit the second one to stretch that lead to four. Houston survives. Houston advances. And we've got every one seed, every two seed through. NC State, the only double-digit seed. That's seven in a row for them. They won seven games in a row. Seven must-have games. Yeah, seven must-have, seven elimination games Literally. in a row. Yeah. And we will have Jaden Taylor, the indie product, Perry Meridian. Obviously, the Butler transfer hit a huge three in overtime of that one on Saturday night. He's going to join us coming up tomorrow as NC State gets ready for Marquette. In that East region coming up this weekend, yeah, it, or South region, yeah. Well, I mean, just what what a what a fantastic weekend of college basketball. And if you're right, if you're if you're a Purdue fan, you feel I think you just feel as good as you felt, right? You feel as comfortable as you have felt uh, in March going forward. And I don't know, you know, we'll have to sort this out as we go this week. I don't know. If I mean you could you could have a replay of the Tennessee game in the Elite Eight, right? With the chance to go to Phoenix and the Final Four. I don't know if people, if Purdue fans have any sort of those superstitions, KB, where you don't want to meet a second team or you don't want to meet, you know, a team a second time in a row. And obviously if you're if you're Purdue, you've beat so many of these teams, including uh, Tennessee and obviously Gonzaga. There's no doubt that Purdue is better than Gonzaga. Gonzaga is a hot team as well. I would say they looked very. very yeah, good I, I would. On I would say Purdue is, uh, or I would say Gonzaga is more different than Purdue is from the beginning of the season. Obviously, both have grown and they've went through you know th- you know twenty twenty five some odd games uh, this season. But I just go back to, and then we'll hit the Pacers here quickly. I just go back to. Rarely do you see a game that's not a 16 versus a 1, okay? Th- just a team's soul be taken from mm-hmm. them the yeah. way that Utah – I mean, Utah State was done in that game. Their body language from like, I don't know, maybe the last 30 – I mean, what would you say, KB? The last 27 minutes of the game – 28 minutes of the game, their body language showed you that they were a broken team. They got in foul trouble early, and they couldn't stop anybody late. Purdue just nailed them. And, and again, I want to go back to that foul point. Danny Sprinkle, their head coach after the game, and just listen to Rick Carlisle audio last night if you want to hear someone disagree with the officiating Yeah, in a game. Danny Sprinkle made it very clear after the game of like, oh, no, we fouled them. 
Like, <laughs> yes, they got into the bonus eight, nine, ten minutes into the game, and it was, you know, really kind of a bloodbath, frankly, uh, from a foul standpoint and Utah State having available bodies. But Danny Sprinkle's like, that's the challenge when you right. face him and when you face Purdue is they are so committed to making sure Zach Eady and even Trey Kaufman ran yesterday, touched the basketball, that they live at the foul line, and it is an earned weapon. I I, I, I want to make sure that we focus on that because that is something that you see teams often. I think you see it in college basketball a little bit more than like the NBA, certainly, Andy. But you see teams in college basketball, they can have a dominant big guy, but then they go like five, six possessions without feeding that guy. Go back to Fairleigh Dickinson last year. They didn't take a two-point shot in that game for nine straight minutes with being in the bonus. So I just think it's further emphasis from Purdue over, you know, knowing. They, kn- they know who they are. Exactly. They and, know who they are. And making sure in those moments you don't lose sight of that. Right. Because, you know, I mean, the NCAA tournament can be chaotic. It sure. can be atmospheres. Oh, you, and can, you can fall in love to fade away threes. Thousand-pound pianos on your back yep. and all of that. So some interesting stuff from Purdue this weekend. Again, a, a certainly a rotation change from Matt Painter. We'll hit on that with Rob Blackman coming up in the 9 o'clock hour. Much, much more bracket-wise, ACC and Big East. Uh, They were outstanding in the opening round. The Pacers get a split this weekend. They went in Golden State Friday. Uh, The Lakers went to the foul line 100 times last night. Awful (laughs) second and third quarters. Carlisle was unhappy. For the Pacers, Rick Carlisle was was pissed, uh, to say the least. Final back-to-back of the year. Tonight, it's no plane ride, no, hell, no bus ride difference. It's in L.A. again. It's the Clippers. The Clippers have not won a home game since March 1st. Yeah, and the Clippers played yesterday as well. It was a, a They didn't help he- the Pacers. No, no, it was a double header there in L.A. They had the Clippers in the morning, and they had the Lakers at night. Clippers lost to the Sixers yesterday, so the Pacers did not get any help. The Heat and the Sixers both win, so just a half game up with 10 to go. Again, this is now game four coming up tonight of this, uh, uh, I guess, a mix of a Midwest and a West Coast road trip. Two and one so far in the road trip. But again, back to back with the Clippers tonight in Chicago Wednesday to close things out. Shout out to Indiana State. They advanced in the NIT, so they will host tomorrow night. They win that. They come to Hinkle for the final four coming up next week. It'll be Cincinnati in Terre Haute this weekend, and we'll hit on the IU women as well oh, throughout our morning check down 630 tonight round two this is where they bowed out last year the home game in round two yeah, the when ca- they lost to the Cavender twins they lost to the TikTokers yeah uh, Corbin the Cavender knows what twins. I'm talking about Certainly. he knows he's smiling yeah you might want to make sure you're <laughs> off the work Wi-Fi for that one Corbin it'll be 5G. Oklahoma tonight in the 4-5 matchup from Assembly Hall good Monday morning to you Purdue fans congrats enjoy the run It is headed to Detroit coming up Friday night against Gonzaga in the Sweet 16. Plenty of boiler chatter, plenty of NCAA stuff as well. Thank you for tuning in here on this Monday morning. It is the wake-up call with KB and Andy and Corbin filling in for Mark Dykton here on 93.5, 107.5 The Fan. Query and Company.
Coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. All right, time for your morning check down. You know what? This is going to be a lot of conversation around Purdue as they move to the Sweet 16 coming up Thursday night there in Detroit. And boy, uh, was it Thursday night? What am I doing here? Friday. Dude? Friday night. Friday night. I thought that sounded right. 739 for the Boilers. By the way, four and a half point early favorites uh, by Purdue. If you like Purdue, I think I kind of I kind of like that line, but we'll have all week to talk about that. Purdue 106 67 all over Utah State yesterday in Gamebridge. Post game, a happy head coach. Here's Matt Painter. Today was just our day. And I thought some things after we kind of got settled into the game and then we, we were able to establish Zach at the rim, I just felt like that was too much for him. And then we balanced some things out, obviously. Made some shots from the perimeter. Two things that really stood out to me, obviously Zach got established there. But I thought Trey Kaufman's ability to rebound the basketball and be a part of the game was big. Then I thought Lance Jones's ability to defend Brown and really give a lot of energy and effort to picking the basketball up and just trying to make it hard on him. Brown's a really good player. 106-67, Purdue wins. Again, the 39-point margin is the fourth biggest for a second-round game in the history of the tournament. The 106 for Purdue the most they've ever scored in 80 tournament games. 31 wins is a program record. And now for the fifth time in the last seven tournaments, Purdue is into the Sweet 16. Just a couple other things I'd add there to Matt Painter's comments, Andy, and talking about Purdue here on opening weekend. I know statistically it might not look like it, but I thought Braden Smith physically looked just fine, which is obviously vital moving forward. I thought Fletcher Lawyer played pretty well in back-to-back games, which that's always kind of an X-factor question. And then again, it's something I want to ask Rob Blackman when he joins us uh, coming up at 9. Certainly Trey Kaufman Wren bounced back in a big way from a poor opening half against Grambling. But going to Miles Colvin and Cam Heidi off the bench, that is a little bit of a switch from what we've seen. You know, it, it's not Ethan Morton and Caleb first getting those minutes for Purdue off the bench. You look at Colvin, you look at Heidi, you're more athletic. You can probably shoot it a little bit better. And Matt Painter, I, I, I think, looks at it and says, hey, Edie's going to get doubled all, all game long, even a lot of attention to Braden Smith. We need more skill. We need more offensive skill on the floor. That's where he's opted to go here with the opening week. And we saw a little bit of that in the Big Ten tournament as well. So just a little wrinkle for Purdue here. Uh, as they advance to the Sweet 16. Yeah, so last week we had Rob Blackman on, right? Last Monday, did we not? After all the Big Ten stuff was out of the way. And I think you asked him the question on Miles Colvin, if I'm not mistaken, because, you know, he played. And defense is helping him get on the floor, but still. there's. I mean, he he played double-digit minutes against Wisconsin. He played eight minutes against, what was it, uh, I think Michigan State, 12 minutes against Wisconsin, and then back-to-back games in the tournament, Grambling. He played 12, and they played 14 the other night. And listen, I know 15 guys played, I think, like, what, 11 or 12 scored yesterday. So yesterday was uh, a little funky, if you will. But Colvin, you know, I remember Purdue. I remember uh, Painter answering probably, I don't know, probably three or four times during the season, answering questions about Colvin. And the answer was, he's going to be a good player for us, knowing all the the stars and the upperclassmen, the experience that was in front of him. Quite frankly, I about wrote him off this season. And it looks like he's going to play double-digit minutes here in these tournament games. That's not something I was expecting. Yes, Purdue and Gonzaga did play earlier this season in Maui. We will talk about that game, of course, a lot all week long. Creighton, Tennessee, that is the other matchup in the Detroit region as Purdue gets ready for the Sweet 16. Uh, all right, late last night, you pro- in my opinion, you missed the game of the tournament if you went to bed. Houston, Texas A&M was absolutely outstanding. Every time it looked like Houston was in control and would you know, kind of put A&M away, Buzz Williams' bunch made a run. We got our first buzzer beater. If I'm going to be selfish, I need more buzzer beaters, Andy. Uh, there hasn't we been have anything. not gotten Nothing. enough late game drama. Nothing. If for my liking, A&M provided that, though, forcing overtime on a baseline out of bounds. Like one of those late ones, it's like, wait, are they going to get the ball in bounds? F- finds a guy at the top of the key who's got to bend down really far to get the ball, chucks it up there, forces OT. Houston made enough plays, though, in overtime to survive that one. So as you look at the Sweet 16, it's a whole lot of chalk. NC State is the only double-digit seed, and the ACC has four of the 16 Sweet 16 teams, the Big East, with three teams in the Sweet 16. Yeah, and by the way, the ACC knobs are just 
They're having I mean, a field I, I, day. I mean, they're doing the SEC thing. They're doing the thing when you're Vanderbilt in Kentucky or Mississippi State football and you live on the shoulders of Nick Saban. The ACC <laughs> is gloating doing? big time here. 6-0 and oh, or 8-1, uh, excuse me. Looking ahead to Thursday for the Sweet 16, you'll have Clemson, Arizona, San Diego State, and UConn, the nightcap, Bama, and North Carolina. And I think a great game. Illinois and Iowa State, the final game of Thursday night. And then Friday, it'll be NC State and Marquette to lead things off at 7.09. Purdue will be on TBS at 7.39, Gonzaga and Purdue. And then again, the nightcap Friday night, I should say the second session, Duke and Houston, (laughs) Creighton and Tennessee to round out Sweet 16 for Purdue fans looking ahead. It's pretty good, man. It'll either be 2.20 or 5.05. Those are your two tip times Sunday for the Elite Eight. So some afternoon action if Purdue is going to advance to the Elite Eight. All right, let's move on to the Pacers. You mentioned late last night. It was the Pacers late last night in L.A. And, boy, you feel bad just because you you could have had some separation. The Sixers won earlier in the night. And, plus, this was just a game that was played at the Pacers' place to hell with defense. 150-145, your final. LeBron and the Lakers get the win over the Pacers. Uh, And you mentioned the discrepancy there with fouls. Uh, I mean, it's just 31 to 14. Only 14 called on the Lakers, 31 on the Pacers. Unhappy post game was Rick Carlisle. Thought our guys really battled in this game. There were just certain things that were impossible to overcome. A 27 free throw differential is one, and a 17 foul differential is the other. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so <laughs> he will leave it at that. We'll see tomorrow if we have Carlisle on, if he'll leave it uh, at that. But you mentioned the back-to-back Clippers tonight. They're still in L.A. That tip-off at 10.30. Our coverage on the fans. A late one. Sorry, Eddie Garrison at 10 o'clock. You know, great start to the road trip and winning in Golden State after winning in Detroit. Um, now, all of a sudden, Andy, you look at the back-to-back record this season. You're 2-10 and 10 in those Uh, If you fall tonight, that puts so much pressure on Wednesday in Chicago to try and get a 3-2 and mark here on this road trip. Uh, I'm curious about Aaron Neesmith. For those that watched it last night, he got absolutely smoked by Cam Reddish on a drive. Stayed in the game, but there was a little bit of uncertainty regarding him afterwards. That'll be something to keep an eye on. Again, the Clippers have lost four straight at home. They're clinging to the four seed out west, trying to get home court here. In round one. All right, shout out to Josh Schertz and the Sycamores of Indiana State. They take care of Minnesota, really in full control of that second round NIT game. Ryan Conwell, the Pike product, outstanding again for them. So tomorrow night, 9 o'clock against Cincinnati. That is the final eight of the NIT. They win that. They'll come right here to Hinkle for the final four next week uh, for the NIT. IU women, second round game with Oklahoma. Boy, Sarah Scalia was. Really incredible in that first-round win over Fairfield. Um, that will be the matchup tonight at 6.30. They're for favored by Terry nine, Moore by the way. I did see that. Isn't that a lot of points for a 4 5 Seems matchup? What have I like missing? it. And, of course, probably a little bit of um, thought back to last year in round two for IU losing at home to Miami in that one. Uh, NFL-wise, you'll see some you know NFL news kind of trickle out here later this morning. It's the annual meetings down in Orlando. Shane Steichen and the rest of the AFC coaches will meet the media here. At a breakfast coming up uh, this morning, Chris Ballard, I think, is scheduled to talk to some of the media coming up tomorrow. So any sort of tidbits that come out from that, we'll probably focus a little bit more on the Colts tomorrow, uh, rightfully so. A lot of tournament chatter and Purdue talk coming up today. Anything else on your plate over there? Uh, did you watch any of the Million Dollar Challenge uh, yeah, actually yesterday? Yeah, actually did. Listen to I, a little bit with Jake. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, I didn't think the entertainment factor was maybe as high as I thought it would be. Not a lot of passing there at the top. But, yes, Alex Pillow, uh takes home the big paycheck of 500000 Scott McLaughlin finishing second. That's 350000 for him. And Felix Rosenquist, 250000 Again, kind of an exhibition race. Yeah. Uh, no points in terms of the full season standings. It's a nice little payday. Uh, but, yes, uh, certainly a very nice payday there as IndyCar out uh, just, I think it's just east of Palm Beach, if I have that correct, uh, this past weekend for their second race of the year. All right, on the other side, much more on the Purdue front. What was most impressive from quite the surgical performance this weekend and yesterday over Utah State and looking ahead to their Sweet 16 matchup with Gonzaga coming up on Friday night. It's, this is the wake-up call. Kevin Bowen, Andy Sweeney, Corbin Lingenfelt are filling in for Mark Dykton here. This is the wake-up call, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan.
The Fan. All right, it's going to be a fun week, at least for Purdue fans, getting ready for Friday night's game. We'll be talking about it. Lots to, lots of chatter. We have some cold stuff we'll get to probably tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Legereus Sneed did get traded over the weekend. That's something, obviously, uh, we'll talk about as we go. And then coming up at 8 o'clock of the uh, top of the 8 o'clock hour, you know, I found it was interesting. Something that Matt Painter said yesterday about Zach Eady has worked its way around the Internet, KB, for the last several hours uh, so we can give our thoughts thoughts on that as well you know one other thing I wanted to react to and I'm interested in how Purdue fans feel this morning the reason I bring that up is you know we talked so much uh, that opening segment and rightfully so uh, and you know the kind of the terminology that I used was Purdue took the soul of Utah State yesterday and you absolutely saw it I mean that team was down to the final TV timeout of the first half and really from you know th- you know last 24 25 maybe even more so minutes of the game they just didn't have anything there was no halftime adjustment there was no you know 15 nothing run coming in the second half that's what Purdue was able to do and so you know I got thinking what is what is now and I'll ask you what is now the reaction or the conversation around Purdue. Because, you know, yesterday, Zach Eady was very forceful of, hey, I'm not satisfied. I, oh, I did he, not. He, he does not know, want to chat yeah, after these games. I, I, I yeah. didn't know. He didn't at all. His his post-game press conference with he wanted TBS. To Andy Katz. <laughs> he yeah. had nothing. Mm-hmm. Poor Andy Katz. Poor Andy Katz would have needed 32 follow-ups to get a couple minutes from Zach Eady. Uh, so he Zach made Shane Steichen look he, expansive. He did. That's the best way to put it. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, Zach Eady after the game is like, I didn't come back and we didn't come back to run it back and go to the Sweet 16. And I like that because I feel like so many people, and I understand it with what happened last season, so many people with Purdue kind of walking on eggshells, like, are we going to believe in Purdue? And I don't know if nationally that has picked up. They were one of the uh, more impressive teams of the weekend. But I don't know, you know, locally here, I don't feel like they have kind of got the monkey off their back or the ultimate prize or the ghosts of tournament pass are really gone as of yet. I I think if this team lost to a Gonzaga team, to a team they've already beat this season, and they quote-unquote only got to the Sweet 16, I I don't feel like anybody would feel that great. I mean, it would be better than losing in the first weekend, so Matt Painter and company would have that, but... I don't view it that way. I view it as, okay, there's that initial scare that you get in the tournament, right, when you're a high seed, and Purdue totally put that to bed. But now the real basketball starts. I mean, now it's going to be Gonzaga. It's going to be Creighton or Tennessee. Both of those have been big boys, SEC, Big E. So I think they they got past the first hurdle, but I don't think the ghosts of tournament pass or any of that nonsense, I don't feel like that was lifted this weekend. To me, that's that's when the big boy basketball starts. I do want to make sure that we go back and, and talk specifically about yesterday and just how that lead ballooned to the point where, oh my gosh, Utah State should just, they should go home early before the level of embarrassment rises to any higher than it was as that game reached the final stages. But I I guess to just kind of build off that point, Andy, I think it's totally fine for Purdue fans to sit here on this Monday morning, Purdue, whatever, exhale a little and celebrate making a fifth Sweet 16 in seven years. That is not easy to do at all and they again I'm gonna use the word earned a lot they earned the chance to have that building sound like Mackey Arena South with how they played all year long so they got a home game pseudo home game in the NCAA tournament yeah, they got the payoff and, yeah and they just absolutely took full advantage of it in both of those games when you know early on I mean whatever Grambling what they were down four late in the first half it's not like it was just an outright beat down yesterday again Utah State for 10 minutes is certainly in that game and then once it started snowball The rest was history, literally. Um, But at the same time, listen to Zach Eady, listen to Matt Painter talk after the game. And Painter was asked specifically, you know, is this momentum you can ride to Friday night? And he made it clear, no. I mean, the NCAA tournament oftentimes 
lives in one game cycles, maybe two game cycles. Right. You can fall into the, hey, we're in this little region and we shoot it really well in this arena. Right. And, and all of that once Friday 739 gets here. I mean, either Purdue or Gonzaga, two teams that looked awesome on opening round weekend one of them's going home so you can you can yeah, you, know, you can have all the momentum you want yeah, yeah you, someone's you can throw going that home. Out, right out the window come 10 o'clock friday night so um i said to jake and jimmy and jake asked me this on on friday all right what does purdue need to get to where do they need to get to in the tournament for this to be considered a successful season and i think it is phoenix i think you've got to get to the final four because um the two-time naismith player of the year does not grow on trees uh, injury luck for the Boilermakers, knock on wood, has been there. I know Braden Smith a little banged up, but for the first time in program history, they've had the same starting five every single game this season. And again, they've earned this, but even in some years, you don't get the the locations that Purdue has gotten. Like, sure. It, it's yeah, Detroit's be, right down the road. It's yeah. going to be a pseudo home game coming yeah. up this weekend again because, I mean, Purdue fans, if they've wanted to, they've known they were going to Detroit for months uh, you know, Gonzaga can't say that. You know, Tennessee can't say that. Creighton can't say that. It won't be as much of a home environment as Gamebridge was. So I think it's fine to give a little bit of sigh of relief and to celebrate it on this Monday. Very quickly, once you start waking up Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, there are bigger goals at hand. But just like winning the Big Ten by multiple games should have been celebrated, just like, you know, winning Maui, in my opinion, should have been celebrated. You don't create the opportunity that's sitting there Friday night without having this throughout the season. So I'm fine with celebrating a little bit. You don't need to cut down the nets and go full-on confetti and put up a banner. But I think it's fine to sit here and certainly, if you want to think back to how this Monday was last year for Purdue fans, it's fine to I don't sit th- there. I don't think they want to. With a smile on your face <laughs> at the Cube. And then, again, you go and find the IU fan. Uh, whereas we, last year, this time, it was the IU fan finding You know, it's funny. Uh, me and Mark were talking when we were, I think you were in here too. You know, We knew that Mark was going to be out this weekend. And we were just thinking, if Purdue loses, poor Cor- uh, Corbin's going to have to answer calls for three hours. <laughs> That's all we could think. Poor Corbin was going to be filling in, answering angry Purdue fans from 7.05 to 10 o'clock. I do want to go back to the point you made about when the lead grew and and the, the the Matt Painter comment to lead off that audio that we just played for you in the last segment, you know, he said it took us a while to settle in the game. Right. If you were to tell me yesterday that at one point Utah State has a 25-24 lead and Braden Smith is heading to the bench with two fouls. You're thinking, okay, here we go. I'm like, oh man, this yeah. is going to be a little bit of a test. This is going to be something different. And for that lead to get back into Purdue's hands, and then to balloon. I mean, it's not like they just sat there with Braden Smith on the bench and whatever. It was a two- or four-point lead at halftime. All of a sudden, it got to 16, and I'm sitting there like, No, it's done. Well, my afternoon just really opened up. Like, I mean, this is over. And no, Purdue were, P- Purdue helped ruin the NCAA tournament yesterday. Given that we, had like, <laughs> we had four hours where we had one game and it was a 25-point game. To yeah. do that There's without no doubt. your quarterback, without your point guard on the floor, I think is huge. And again, Fletcher Lawyer, um, I thought played really well, really in both of the games this weekend. And your others. I mean, Trey Kaufman, Wren, I thought was extremely poor in the first half Friday night. Much better yesterday, of course. Really set the tone early on when you needed it. Of course, Edie was Shaq and then some other guys stepping up. So it, it, it's the nature to how that lead really turned into, oh, my gosh, this is an outright beatdown without Braden Smith because that was Friday night. Friday night, it was all Edie and Braden Smith early on. Without those two, you know, it, it, it could have been totally different. Um, for that lead to grow like it did, again, without your quarterback, uh, I think it's huge because if you're a Purdue fan and you're trying to be extra optimistic about this weekend – you can look at it and say, man, our point guard wasn't even at kind of the full All yeah. American level that he's played oh, yeah. at. Zach, he didn't have to play in the second for half if he didn't want him to. Of yeah. the season. And obviously, you hope that's there because some great point guards await here coming up in Detroit. Yeah, we had a, we had a stat sent to us. Oh, goodness. I need, I need to find it. Purdue scored 57 points in the second half. Edie scored two of those 57. That's a great stat. And then you mentioned the ballooning in the first half. I mean, it was the eight minute mark. That was a 25 24 game. Like you mentioned, again, 25-24, eight minutes later, it was 49-33 at half. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> That's unbelievable. And, and, and again, I remember lo- looking down at the box score at one point, and the guards were one for 11, Braid Smith and Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer. And then 
because they were living at the foul line and again, earned that right to live at the foul line. Uh, that's why they were in full control of that game. So for those that missed it, uh, as we've said all morning long, the 39-point margin is the fourth largest in round two of any game in NCAA tournament history, and the 31 wins for Purdue also the most in program history. Purdue and Illinois, that's it from the Big Ten still left. Illinois looked very impressive. Yeah, they did. And both yeah. of those wins this week. Yeah, there were a couple teams, you know, I, I just thought for the most part, not everybody, you had a Baylor lose last night and some other teams, but for the most part, for what you get from the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, the uh, the the better seeds, if you will, protected themselves, you know, and some were uglier than others and not everyone, you know, was head by 30 some odd points like Purdue was, but for the most part, uh, they protected each other just quickly. You talk about guards in Purdue. I need to give a shout out. I know some people frown on these things. Need to give a shout out back to Friday night. And my guy, Carson Barrett, uh, who came in the game and hit that three pointer to give Purdue the cover. Uh, for those of us, the walk-ons were very good <laughs> for, late Friday for night. The, for those of us who may have, uh, you had twenty-seven and a half. Yeah, for those of us who may have been a little perturbed about, about the way you know Purdue was ending that game, we thank one Carson Barrett, the uh, senior right there from Lafayette, Indiana, taking care of business late in that I'm game. Sure, many thank people you had him. tuned out yesterday by the <laughs> final few minutes, but yesterday when Purdue throws it in the post to Will Berg late in the shot clock there, oh, yeah, and he hits like a nice turnaround like, like a turn- jump. Yeah. Like beautiful. I mean, yeah. oh, just yeah. look beautiful. I mean, the rest of the Big Ten had to be like, "Are you kidding me?" There's another seven footer. How another what's one? He, what's he seven? Is he seven four? Yeah, I think he's like. Is seven, he seven three, two? Seven, or, seven, well, he's got like room that. to grow. He's still a very young man. Uh, every one and two seed through to the Sweet Sixteen. That's just the second time we've seen that since two thousand and nine, and the third time it's happened since ninety five. So we're not used. To all this one two C, like you said, Baylor out as a three, Kentucky, of course, out as a three. NC State, the only double digit seed uh, to move on. Are to, they a Cinderella given that they're out of the ACC? Ah, I, I, given that they no, paid their coach $5 million? No, That's not a Cinderella, right? There. Yeah, okay. And I mean, honestly, that was another game. Boy, I mean, Oak, Oakland did not get a shot up there at the end of regulation. The, you the, had a chance. The, the end of games have been a little lackadaisical. On some of the games, I thought on Saturday and you Sunday really until later to. until later in the yeah, night. I mean, obviously. you really needed to stay up late Saturday to get Creighton, Oregon, that game in double overtime, uh, and then last night. You know, I know a lot of people, of course, bailed early on that one. I don't know maybe you're up watching the Pacers, uh, but Houston and Texas A&M was outstanding. A couple other things just from opening weekend of note. Uh, boy, Tyler Kolek for Marquette. The other game over here at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. That was Question a great of game. Where he was at health yeah, wise. That was a game. He certainly looked very, very healthy. Outstanding. Colorado. I was very impressed by them exiting Dayton there. Uh, again, tomorrow we're gonna have Jaden Taylor on the show, the Perry Meridian product, who plays for NC State, hit a huge three in that one. And boy, you want to talk about dominant? And I know this dates back to last year's tournament as well. This eight game run for UConn, Andy. You look at margin of victory. It just it, it has to be one I, of the better ones. They just crush Northwest that you've seen really in in, in tournament history. I did. Did they have the biggest margin of victory for a title team last year? Did they get that number? I I don't know if it, they it got very to that close, number. If yeah, not. if not, I mean they've just been steamrolling, haven't they? So they will get San Diego State coming up. Uh, that is in the Purdue time slot on Thursday. So that's seven thirty nine on Thursday. That's the biggest spread in the Sweet 16 round, if you want to look at it. Nothing in the double digits. UConn is a nine-and-a-half-point favorite over San Diego State. Matt Painter had some strong comments yesterday, Zach Eady related I had to chuckle listening to that, so we'll play that audio coming up. On the other side, more bracket talk all morning long. And again, we'll look at the Pacers. They split their road uh, games coming up. this. Uh, or they did this past weekend, winning Golden State, losing last night to the Lakers, Rick Carlisle. Not happy at all with the officiating and the Colts. Did they miss out on their one big splash potential here? In the offseason, we'll touch on that as well. It is the wake-up call here on a Monday morning. You're listening right here on 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. The offseason.
All right, 8 o'clock hour, broadcasting live from the drivehuber.com studios. KB and Andy hanging out with you. A couple more hours to go. Obviously talking a ton about what we saw this weekend and yesterday afternoon there uh, in Gamebridge. Purdue was so, so very good. And they move on. Sweet 16, Friday night, a little Gonzaga. Uh, and then on Sunday, you know, they keep winning. It's going to be Sunday. It's going to be Creighton or Tennessee for the right to go to the Final Four. And boy, if they can go to the Final Four, Kevin, it's going to be uh, one of the most beloved teams of all time with all the records that they're breaking. Yeah, go ahead. Want to make sure we seen? gave a shout out here. You don't get this very often okay. on a Monday morning. Shout out to Janelle. Okay. okay. And this is via her husband, uh, Matthew. Matthew says, feel free to give a shout out uh, to the wife this morning. I'm trying to have a combo with her. And she tells me, I'm listening to KB and Andy talk about Purdue. You're damn right. Then shows him the there hidden we go. AirPod. <laughs> I guess you'll have that conversation <laughs> later in the day, right? Purdue oh, fans goodness. rejoicing. Janelle, yeah. congrats on the Boilers. What do, uh, what do what do couples talk about in the morning? I'm usually uh, up and out of it. What do you, you guys have a conversation or what? I was going to say, uh, your guess is as good as mine here <laughs> how, on this Monday morning. How are the morning. brackets looking? So KB hates that I do this, but I have two brackets. Oh, uh, you hate it. You look down oh, on me. Pathetic. You snub your nose at me. I was me. two for five on my upsets. Well, here's the, well, this was the year. This was finally the year to not take the upsets. Upsets. I am 36% on my UConn's going to win it all bracket. And then my other bracket, KB, I'm 84%. So I need to look at 1075thefan.com so and see where that's at. Right now, the leader is now, is this allowed? There's a he, here's a guy who's leading the one here uh, for us, okay? Presented by Cons Fine Wines and Spirits. You ready for this? Oh, no. Does it's, he have seven brackets? Well, no, he does. It's Mike 23. Like, I don't know. This is Pacerland. That's getting very close to Chicago Bull Mike 23 stuff. I don't know if I like that, but he's our leader. He's at like 77% right now. I wouldn't now. mind seeing him bow out <laughs> after hearing that. Uh, we'll obviously oh, talk a goodness. lot about Purdue and Gonzaga throughout the week. Just a little brief look back on what happened in Maui. Uh, Gonzaga actually was up five at halftime of that game. Purdue outscored Gonzaga 43-28 in the second half. It was the worst three-point shooting game of the season for Purdue, 4 of 17. It was one of the worst three-point shooting games of the year for Gonzaga. Uh, I did find it interesting. Matt Painter had <laughs> he had quite a few details on Gonzaga after the game. <laughs> you got to love all ball Mr. Painter there and how much he knows already about the Zags. And he pointed this out, and hell, just watch them against McNeese, watch them against Kansas. That was a beatdown to Kansas by oh, yeah. Gonzaga yeah. on Saturday. They're shooting the basketball very well here over the last month or so. If you look at it, they've lost two games in the last two months. Now, I get they're playing the conference that there's nobody there, both of those losses to St. Mary's. They did win at Kentucky. I mean, that, that's a very impressive win uh, in February there. All of their wins by double digits outside of those two losses to St. Mary's. So, you know, when you look at it, they have been very impressive in, you know, taking care of competition that obviously is not Purdue here over the last couple of months. Um, I do think something to watch for this weekend, if indeed Purdue beats Gonzaga and then plays Tennessee, for example, coming up on Sunday. Remember, Purdue has played Gonzaga now each of the last two years. They played them out in Portland uh, two years ago. There's still a couple of Gonzaga players that start for them and Nolan Hickman uh, and Aaron Watson that were on that Gonzaga team a couple years ago and started in that game. Is there just a little bit of a, we have seen Edie before, we won't have just the outright shock of facing him? Like, if you watch Grambling in Utah State. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, they had their pants down by sure. like two minutes into the game. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, can you please take me out, coach? Like, I I, I can't do this. <laughs> Um, and, and it's funny or, I bring up Gonzaga or they're because, fo or they're fouling a lot. Well, that whether that too. be yeah, any exactly. other, or, and they're fouling like Gonzaga's going to know well, you can't do that. If you do that, it's done. Right. And Utah State, I mean, they had a dude go in the game yesterday in the first ten minutes who didn't even play Friday night. I mean, imagine turning to a guy who doesn't play in your opening round game ten minutes into your second round game. Um, and, and I think back to Mark Few. Ironically enough, remember when Baylor just hounded the hell out of them in the national title mm -hmm. game here in Indy? Yeah. And beat them. Yeah. They were supposed to play. Baylor and Gonzaga were supposed to play in the regular season that year. And the game got canceled due to COVID. And Mark Few, he's like, I don't think it would have made a huge difference. But there is this thought in my head of hindsight's twenty twenty. 
if we would have felt their pressure and their defense in that regular season game. Right, that physicality. Would right. we all of a sudden have That's been able point. to settle into the game earlier? Now, again, that was four and a half months ago, Purdue and Gonzaga and Maui. Um, obviously, the teams are a lot different, but that is just a, a, a thought that I have coming into this weekend of, you know, Gonzaga and Tennessee at least have seen it before. But again, Gonzaga had a five point lead at halftime of that game in Maui. And then Purdue was outstanding in the second half of that one. Fletcher Lawyer was not very good in that one. ED was ED, 25 and 14 yeah, in that one. Th- that's the thing that comes to my mind with Maui is how, 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 how not very good Lawyer was in that game. And then he bounced back against Tennessee the next game, right? That's what it was. Tennessee exactly. was the next uh-huh. game and right. he bounced back. It was fantastic. So yeah, that's what's, that's what's in my mind. You know, the Baylor, the physicality, that's not a bad point. I, I would say, you know, Gonzaga knowing, and, and I don't know if Crane will have any of this. By then, you've seen so much. You know, you've seen Edie play 100 games, you know, it feels like in college basketball. You've seen him play this year and through the NCAA tournament last year and everything else. I don't know how much that affects, but I mean, going forward, you know, Tennessee, if you face them, they would have seen you. Gonzaga, obviously, and then on top of it, you know, Crane's got a seven-footer as well. You know, they can throw some bigger bodies uh, your way. I- I'm excited for Detroit. I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, if you're a Purdue fan. I mean, just absolute heavyweight matchup. Yeah, there, there's, you know, nothing against, you know, it's funny. I was, you know, the viewership is just through the roof right now on this NCAA tournament. And it's funny that we talk so much. And what was the conversation going into the tournament? The conversation going into the tournament was all of these upsets that were going to happen, whether it be Samford or James Madison or Will Wade and McNeese State. And we went through all these, you know, all these different Cinderella's. Well, we haven't had a buzzer beater until late Sunday night, right? And I'm I'm not saying nobody, but not as many people saw that than Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or even Sunday during the day. Scheduling on the tournament is something we can dive into later, even though we sound like old men uh, yelling about what time some of these games starts. But it was all about the the underdogs and, you know, some of the teams that were highly ranked we didn't didn't love. And it's a very chalky tournament, and there's not a lot of buzzer beaters. Leaders, yet everybody is watching and it, oh, people always think you need the Cinderella to draw in 10 million viewers on one of these games and it's just it's just not true well, I don't know what to tell you it's just not true and it can go both ways like I would have loved and my bracket would have loved it I would have loved to see Oakland hit that game winner on Saturday night beat NC State and we have that Cinderella still alive here in the Sweet 16 but Andy just look at the schedule Thursday and Friday night I know I mean, it, it's mouthwatering when you look at some of these matchups coming up this weekend. I know you want to play that Matt Painter, um, Zach Eady clip, which Painter talked about a drop the mic moment from him yesterday afternoon. Before we get to that, I, I don't think like there's like 39 point momentum from beating Utah State that applies to Gonzaga Friday night in Detroit. But I am curious the bounce back from Trey Kaufman Wren yesterday and how he played in that game. The fact that Miles Colvin and Cam Heidi really gave you quality minutes uh, this weekend, what does that do for them? You know, I thought Painter pointed out, like, you know, Colvin and Heidi, Colvin obviously being a freshman, they had not experienced the NCAA tournament. So for those two to kind of get their feet wet, uh, to play well, both of them I thought were key contributors, does that help Purdue moving forward? Because, I mean, hell, I think back to a Butler run over a decade ago when all of a sudden, you know, Brad Stevens looks at Chris John Hopkins on the bench and is like, we need you right now. And he delivers for them in the Elite Eight against Florida. Like, at some point, it's not just Edie and Braden Smith. You have to rely on some of these other guys. Does that help Purdue at all? moving forward. Yeah, for Col- Colvin being a freshman, I-, I move him aside. Again, his minutes going back to especially the Wisconsin game in the Big Ten tournament, the first couple games here, I- you know, his his growth, I would say, in the last few weeks is something I didn't I-, I didn't think we'd talk about him, quite frankly, in the tournament other than, hey, they beat down a 16 seed. It would be and like everybody Jairus got Walker in. all of a sudden playing 25 minutes for the Pacers. Right. Like, you, it would you, have you, that same. Yeah, like, you get into the playoffs and now Jairus Walker right. is playing and contributing like, I, and I, I've just written, shots. you know, I've just said, okay, Jairus Walker, this is a redshirt year. And for the most part with Colvin, I'm like, okay, he's out of the rotation. And that's been a switch for Matt Painter. Ethan Morton, Caleb First, out of the rotation. They're just so deep. Miles Colvin, Cam Heidi, in the rotation. The, the reason, I listen, this is a corny team culture, March Madness, college basketball th- thing that I'm going to say. But Purdue has. 
has that. And I think other people do. I think Calvin Sampson has that. Uh, I, you know, at times, Coach K had that. I mean, you see this with the great teams. I hate to just single out those two. Uh, Tom Izzo, I'm sure, probably some of those older Michigan State teams because Tom Izzo loses 15 games a year now. Uh, that, you know, this Purdue team has very much a... You know, no one is bigger than the team, even though we know guys like Zach Eady and Braden Smith are. I mean, they are the team. Zach Eady is the team to a certain extent, and we'll get to him here in a second. But it just feels like, you know, guys have had, whether it's Gillis, who has had to give up his starting spot, or it's guys that have played, and maybe their time has been pulled back here recently. Once you got to March, so a guy like Colvin gets a few more minutes. Uh, that, that to me, is this team. Their depth, but also the fact that they all understand, hey, you know, if Painter tells us we need to do this, this, and this to win, that's what we're going to do. Not every team has that. No. And, so often they don't. And I want to play. I don't think we'll get to it today, Andy, but I did jot it down. At some point this week, I want to play Trey Kaufman Wren's answer to the final question of the press conference yesterday. It was a very – really, the question was very similar to what you just brought up about the acceptance of a role. Um, I mean, that's a five-star recruit, and he has been very accepting of – his role at Purdue and the answer it's just like it seems like a Matt Painter just like poster child of what I want my players to say and honestly it's a credit to the staff in terms of recruiting those types of guys to guys that are going to come into your program and be willing to yeah. accept that and you know this firsthand not every five star L- listen is going I, I, to accept I, wh- that but it, it, it's not about getting the shiniest and the flashiest pieces to the puzzle it's about getting the right yeah, pieces I, to the puzzle. You know, when I when I followed, you know, so many Kentucky teams, by the way, they could unload Calipari this week. That would be a juicy story for you. I don't think they're going to. You know, Cal Cal had teams that did that were very much like this Purdue team where it's like, all right, you need me to play 22 minutes. All right, you need me to play 12. It's okay. And then there are other teams that, you know, that you run into where where that's not the case. So Purdue's got it going, man. They got it going. They had a great weekend. And uh, now it's Friday night. It's Gonzaga. I, listen, I don't mind saying it. I think they win that game. And I think we're looking at an Elite Eight matchup. Uh, I had Creighton slotted in there against Purdue at the beginning of the tournament on all my 19 different brackets. So that's what, that's what I'll go with. Now, I, I have the question here as well. This worked its way around Twitter yesterday. Matt Painter, and again, I have the question and everything here, so everything is in context. Matt Painter was asked about he was asked about his reaction to people. I I, I don't even understand it that think that Zach Eady is good just because he is tall. And the question was asked like this is a narrative that is just lighting the college basketball world on fire. I don't see it that way, but Matt Painter had about a minute answer, which made its way viral on Twitter X yesterday, and it's pretty funny. Just Take a tee listen. Tee him up, right? Yeah, tee him up. Go ahead. Greg Braggs, Boilers in the Stands. Matt, uh, Zach finishes with 54 points and 35 rebounds in two games here in Indianapolis. You see people you know, around the country, even you know, fans, but even pe- people that cover the game say he's just tall. What would you say to the people that say that, that are only looking at the size and not just the game? Yeah, they, they just shouldn't cover basketball. Yeah, you know. And so, like, you go to school and, and you learn things or whatever, but we all don't like every single class we're in, right? It's kind of a necessary evil. It's like going to work. Like, you don't like everybody you work with or you don't like certain parts of your job. And, you know, it's tough, right? You, you got to be able to deal with, like, certain things that, that are difficult. And so I just think everybody should, like, take tests on their knowledge of what they're doing. Like, I think all coaches should take a test so they understand refereeing. And I think all referees should take a test so they understand coaching. And I think all journalists should have to take a basketball quiz or a test or anybody that tweets, they should have to be able to do it. And if they say something so moronic as that, then they should have to have a probationary status where they, they can't tweet for like three months. I think it'll help like, like society, you know, like just try to knock out the fools, you know, so they don't have to, you know, meet at the local Walmart and say things that don't make any sense. <laughs> Quite the drop the mic there. Go ahead. I got some. I, I got some thoughts. I, I, I guess. I, I w- where is this stemming from? Like, have you or I ever brought up the 
Zach Eady is tall, therefore he's good at basketball? I, the only thing I can think of is the Dan Lebitard show last week. Yeah, I'm just had, not but, one that likes watch these yeah, national shows. But, and then but they don't sudden, follow college basketball. They're yeah, having fun. Like, yeah, they, they're having fun with, you know, Purdue having a monster in the middle in Zach Eady. Yeah, I I don't have time for just the these people all of a sudden fly in, <laughs> swoop in for the college basketball season, and you know whatever. Maybe their Peacock subscription wasn't working earlier in the year, and now this is their first look at Zach Eady, and they don't love the fact that whatever Purdue throws it into a back to the basket guy. It's uh, to so many Purdue guests we've had on this year, Andy. I've thrown the question: What is Zach Eady's greatest attribute? Because I think it's such a difficult question to answer. Because he's so quality, skilled, whatever you want to describe him, in so many different facets. Like, seven four dudes, let's just start with this simple thing. Seven four dudes don't catch the basketball <laughs> with as much frequency <laughs> as right. Zach Eady right. catches the basketball. Right. Seven four dudes don't shoot 70% from the foul line. Right. Seven four dudes don't have the stamina. To, to, I mean, listen to Stan Van Gundy. Or know where the double team's coming from to get it to the exactly. right guy. Yeah, all that stuff. Stan right. Van Gundy was on the call. And by the way, his, 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 I love, his I love energy him. was unbelievable I love Van Gundy. in all these games. Yeah. I love just how unfiltered he was. He was in, like, sheer amazement at the stamina of Zach Eady. Of, like, oh, my gosh, he can run up and down the floor. And, like, you know, Stan Van Gundy, that's one degree removed from, you know, Yao Ming. And, and obviously, Jeff coaching him. So, like, the, the, the fact that this guy who coached in the NBA for as long as he did is in awe over a seven-footer stamina is pretty darn amazing to me when you factor that in. So, like, go down that list. Stamina, skill, touch, like, catching the basketball. It's such a lazy comment, boy. Matt, Matt Painter, it's almost like he placed that person in the crowd with well, how, <laughs> with, 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 with he, how he was teed, 20. Up, well, I mean, teed up for that answer. What just an, I, I don't get where this is coming from and why we need to – you know, commit as much time to addressing it. Like, I guess we have to, but it just seems so lazy. And so like, I don't watch Purdue <laughs> is what that answer yeah, is. Well, here's okay. So let's go back. Uh, and I had to look, I listen, you know, I love all these things. Boilers in the stand. So I didn't know. I always, I always love, they tell where they're from the, you know, Hey, I am from, you know, I'm from the fan in Indianapolis. I'm Kevin Bowen. And I want to talk to you about Colvin or about Braden Smith. And so you get this in the tournament. And so I heard, you know, I saw this working its way around and then I went back and I listened again, boilers in the stands. It's one of those guys that asked the question there. Uh, and, and I, I thought it was honestly, I just thought, I guess I still do. It was a little bit of a kind of a fanboy question because I don't, I don't view this as something that we've ever talked about. Like I'm trying to find if you say, well, this guy mentioned it or that guy. Yeah. But for Matt Painter to almost, he, he was almost like it's been nagging him. Like it's something that has been a conversation piece around Zach Eady so much that he finally, when he was in front of the big cameras at the NCAA tournament, needed to finally settle the score on Zach Eady. I just, I didn't understand the question, quite frankly, and I like the answer. Listen, the guys asking the question got the viral moment. So I want to be clear, they won because Matt Painter's like, oh, I'm going to give you something here. But as far as college basketball people, college basketball people have kissed the bleep of Purdue and Zach Eady, have they not, for the better part of a couple years? So anyone that we've had on that's been a college – I mean, can you imagine Mike DeCourcy coming on these airs, uh, these the, these airwaves, and saying, well, you know, I mean, the thing about Zach Eady is he's 7'5". It's the only reason he's good. It's the only reason Purdue is good is because they have a monster there – in the middle, college basketball uh, people adore Matt Painter. College basketball people adore the Zach Eady story and his. This is a guy that didn't play college basketball. He got he got to Purdue, worked his ass off, and went and and, and became an all a two time you know player of the year. And is and by the way has moved himself from not being in the draft. Sam Vecini tweeted this out last night to probably being a late first probably a second round pick last year to now where he is absolutely viewed as a first round pick. I, I just, I feel like it was, it's a great quote. It's a funny quote, 
but there's not a lot of substance behind this narrative. And if it is, like you said, it's just some people, you know, flying in, 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 flying in for the tournament. Yeah. But even then, I feel like they that's wanna, not the conversation piece. They, I don't know. And they don't want to watch whatever. The big man, you know, uh, turn around over yeah, but, his left shoulder and have hook shots and go to the foul line. But, but think about this as well. And listen, I know, listen, Purdue drawing fouls yesterday. This is what I saw from people maybe who are not seeing a ton of Purdue this year. You know, Purdue, they, they drew a lot of fouls yesterday. And so I did see that as one of the national narratives, which is a lot of, different. By the way, that I mean that is a lot different, different than, than like Zach Eady's tall. Th- than being tall, I, I will say this. I mean, one of the great things for Zach Eady is that he is seven five. Though it's not the only reason that he's good. You mentioned the touch. You mentioned the basketball smarts. We mentioned Stan Van Gundy and and um, you know how Eady is able to run the floor and how he's got better. I'm bending the knee to Zach Eady, but of course, one of his great attributes is that he's a foot taller than so many of the guys on the floor. I mean, and that's okay to say. It doesn't it doesn't denigrate him at all. I mean, we don't do that for a guy that's got a 48 inch vertical. We don't say, well, I mean, the only reason he's good is that he can go up and he can cram on anybody, uh, it, it's, right? It, I mean, in a way, and I don't know if this is a great analogy, but it just it reminds me of the LeBron of like, well, if I were 6'8 and 260, I'd be that good as well. I'm yeah, like, I just don't what understand a total the narrative. disservice to LeBron and whatever, basketball IQ or his vision or however else, the other attributes that you want to describe with that. Um, I mean, the numbers. It's like numbers since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? I mean, isn't that what they're saying in the NCAA tournament? I mean, he had 53 and 35 this weekend. In two games, 53 points, 35 rebounds. He played 57 minutes. Yeah, you want the stat? Here Here it is. Uh, and all the way back 1968, the, you know, since since Lou Alcindor, Zach Eadie, yes, 53 points and 35 and 35 rebounds through the first two games. Lou Alcindor had 50 and 41 through the first uh, two games. Zach Eadie shooting 68%. Lou Alcindor shot 71%. And I don't know what the minutes looked back in 1968, but I know that Zach Eadie scored two points and sat the final, what, 11, 12 minutes of the game the other night. And I just don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a fan. This, I guess, gets into like a little bit of like, you know, what do you believe in as a radio show? I'm not this like, let's take hot Twitter take and talk about it for three hours. You know, like that. I think people that have listened to our show have realized that the praise for Zach Eady is a lot and deservedly so and should be there because he's earned that. So Purdue just made the Sweet 16. They just won by 39 points. I'm fine to talk about it for 10 minutes like we just did, but I don't think this is something that needs to dominate the conversation today. Like. It- it's it, a twi- it's a Twitter it's a social media conversation. Right. It, 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 that's what it with, is. With that's like, all no it is. substance. I'm fine if it had some substance behind it, but to me, there's just none of it. So instead, I choose to think they just won by 39. He, he, here's what they it just is: just scored the most points in program history in the NCAA tournament. They are going to their fifth Sweet 16 in seven years. They have a legitimate shot to make their first Final Four in decades. That to me is what should be celebrated and should be praised more than this debate of. Zach Eady's good because he's tall. Uh, there's I, a lot I, of seven two, seven three. <laughs> there, there's what at least a dozen uh, a couple, seven two, yeah. seven three, yeah, seven sure. four guys. I mean, sure. Remember Kenny George? Remember oh, that yeah. name? They aren't putting Boy, up Kareem. Random one. They aren't putting up Kareem numbers, Andy. <laughs> no, no. I mean, even like the player, the guy of Creighton's pretty good. I, I think also what it is is Matt Painter knows, and I think some they got they organically were able to do this with. Losing early in the tournament last year, they were able to play the card of chip on the shoulder because of how they played last year in the tournament. And then you get through Grambling State, and then you get through Utah State, and you punish them, and everyone's going to be patting you on the back, and everyone's going to be saying, well, the ghosts of tournament passed, and all that is gone. I think there's a part of this of Matt Painter playing psychologist just a little bit. Understanding that, okay, now we've moved on. And I might be wrong. I might be misreading this situation. Now that we have moved on to the second weekend of the tournament, coaches always try to find a way to find ways that their team is disrespected or a chip on the shoulder, perhaps. Yeah, listen to Dan Hurley's comments after the game yesterday. And maybe maybe this is a little bit of that, that – 
you know, Matt Painter, hey, I'm going to protect my guy, even though there's nothing there to protect me other than Big Ten, Big Ten guys on Twitter. Mike1294 on Twitter has something to say. And that's, you know, Myron Metcalf yesterday did a podcast and he basically talked about that, that, you know, separate Twitter from the, the rest of us. But maybe it's a way for Matt Painter to say, hey, you guys were great. We just had a great, great weekend. We've had a great last few years, but they still don't, they still aren't buying into you. Maybe it's a chip on the shoulder thing. I, I but I, 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 I still with, can't believe his team views it that way. I'm fine with Painter's answer. Like, I mean, totally. I mean, he gets asked a question. I mean, it's sitting on a tee for you. You might as well hit it out of the park. So that's exactly what he did. It's just I, I, I don't have the energy to commit more than about ten minutes on such. A narrative. Rob Blackman, voice of the Boilers, coming up at nine. Let's lead off morning. Let's actually go a little Pacers. You go Pacers. Okay. Morning checkdown. The morning checkdown brought to you by the National Invitation Tournament. Experience basketball's beginning with the NIT coming to Hinkle Field House April second and fourth. Let's get to the Pacers last night. Boy, uh, they split this weekend. What a high-scoring game. 151-45. That's your final losers in L.A. to LeBron and company. You know, they got down in this game, KB. They came all the way back, had a chance at the end. Here's Rick Carlisle on the fight of his team. Second unit battled their butts off in the second half. That last four or five-minute stretch, you know, the first unit came back in there, and, and they were defiant about, you know, hanging in the game. And then, you know. At a certain point, it's you got to play absolutely perfectly, and that was going to be very, very, very difficult. But the level of fight is something that we can, we can we can continue to build on. Yeah, like I said, one fifty, one forty-five. That's your final Pacers back to back tonight. They stay right there, same hotel in L.A. Uh, the Clippers. That they, the, by the way, the Clippers did play yesterday as well. So both teams will be on a back-to-back. Both teams did play in LA. LA. The Clippers played in the morning, the Lakers at night. It's Clippers Pacers, 1030 tonight. Our coverage on the fan at 10 o'clock. Oh, tell me it's Wally Zerbiak who brought this up. Is that the same idiot that called Tyrese Halliburton yeah. a w- wannabe w- all-star? W- Wally picked Utah State to win the game. I mean, come on. I, I, just, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the time for that. But um, again, but again, I just, again, I'm sorry. Someone's going to pick against you. In the yeah, tournament. I, I don't have an issue with that. It's, I guess it's okay if somebody does pick against you. I have more of the issue of, again, if it's the uh, he's good because he's tall. Yeah. There. We've been down the road with Wally before. Big one for the Pacers tonight. I mean, honestly, all of them are big at this point. Ten to go. Uh, just a half game up right now on Miami and Philly. They did win Friday. Shout out to Miles Turner, all-time leader in block shots. He set that record passing Jermaine O'Neal on Friday as they did win in Golden State. Tyrese Halliburton had that bounce back Friday. A little bit back to kind of what he has been this month, though yesterday in L.A. All right, uh, back to the NCAA tournament. It's been pretty chalky throughout. Again, first uh, two rounds, we have all ones and two seeds advanced. Just the third time that's happened since 95. I think it's 2019 and 2009, the two other times we've had that happen. NC State is the only double-digit seed for those planning ahead for this weekend. As we said all morning long, it'll be 739 Friday night, from Detroit, Purdue is a four and a half point favorite in that one. If Purdue advances to the Elite Eight, two twenty or five oh five, those are the scheduled start times for the Elite Eight. If you look at the Thursday slate, you're out west, so that's Clemson, Arizona, Alabama, Carolina, and then out east, San Diego State, UConn, Illinois, Iowa State. That is, boy, that's a big time matchup right there in the Sweet Sixteen. And then Friday, obviously, you've got Purdue's region with Gonzaga and Purdue and then Creighton and Tennessee, and then the South region, NC State, Marquette, and how about Duke and Houston? All these matchups are great. I mean, can I just complain for a second? No double-digit favorites. That, that Illinois, Iowa State is in Boston, and it's going to tip off at like 10, 15 at night. <laughs> can I just complain? Can I just complain as someone who has to work early in the morning? Corbin, as someone this week who is having to work early in the morning. Didn't we I, whine enough about tip times whine? last week? Can I just I, whine I did for try, a second? I, I tried to warn Purdue fans about the chaos that would ensue you Friday did. night. You were right. Uh, outside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. The pictures, It. I mean, it looked like hell. Everybody trying to get, b- <laughs> either get back into Gamebridge or get into Gamebridge. It happens every year. It happens every single year. I don't year. get it. Every year. Yeah. The last team to tip off. I don't know what to tell you. In the afternoon session, that means the night session is never going to start on time, and it's going to be mass chaos trying to get in the building. That's exactly what happened with Purdue. Plus, 
you're, on Friday You're across night. the street. You're trying to get as many beers in your system. Oh, before yeah. You go. You're trying they to get one more bucket you, of tin uh, roof and well, coaches yeah. before you head over. They got to stay in line. You're, you got to pee and everything. It's an entire thing. Yeah. Shout out to Josh Shirts and the Sycamores <laughs> of Indiana State. Moving on to the Elite Eight. So that is tomorrow. That's Cincinnati. Now, uh, make sure I have this story right. Cincinnati's got the one and only Jizzle James on their roster, right? <laughs> oh, is that who they have? You yeah. know Jizzle's father. Uh, help me here. That would be one Edrin James. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, we talked about that earlier in the season. Now, one time Edrin decided to take a taxi to Terre Haute for training camp. <laughs> you think Ed just going to taxi it over there, I-70? You think J&B uh, can give him a ride tomorrow night? I, I don't think he's going to taxi. I don't know anyone who taxis unless you land somewhere. They don't have you know, they don't have Ubers right outside the airport. I believe the story was that they found out the taxi driver's license was suspended once they started <laughs> to do a little more research on the old story. There. So shout out to Josh Shirts and Company. Ryan Conwell, outstanding. Indiana State takes he's care aver- of Minnesota. He's averaging about nine a game, too. Jizzle? Yeah, it's not bad. He's starting to play a little bit more here. What if your name was late. Jizzle? Yeah, that did not make the final few it for didn't? the uh, Max Bowen name. This no. went with uh, Max. Mm-hmm. This is very traditional. Yeah. Right. Uh, are you women in action tonight? Oklahoma, that is 630. I think it's ESPN 2. If I'm not mistaken there. 4-5 matchup in round, t- round two. So we'll see if Terry Moran's bunch... Can advance to the Sweet 16. Alex Pillow takes home 500K from the Thermal Race. Again, that was the big exhibition. A lot of money at stake there. Scott McLaughlin, uh, second. Felix Rosenquist, third. And you'll start to see some NFL news trickle out from owners' meetings that's taking place down there in Orlando. Don't think Jim Mercer scheduled to talk. Uh, Shane Sykin at a AFC Coaches Breakfast this morning. Chris Ballard tomorrow. Certainly Ballard will be asked about Legere Sneed in the offseason as a whole. And, Andy, we haven't had time to mention it this morning. Thoughts on one Dusty May to Michigan? Yeah. I, I'm Okay, so here's how this thing broke down from my viewpoint. Um, my people in Louisville basically told me that they thought they had Dusty May. And so much so that they basically got the big room ready, KB, for the press conference. Like the like they thought they had them, and then what was that? Was it late Friday night that all this happened? Was it late Friday night or was it into Saturday it's like that Friday all this? Friday night was Sneed, and Saturday night was Dusty. Yeah, I think that's right. And so Dusty May, you know, he was up there for Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt tried to woo him, uh, and then Michigan flew in and got him. I think the thing that's interesting for me, he got a five year deal at Michigan. And I know the starting off point, I know this is a huge raise, so I want to be clear. I'm not acting like this is very little money, but he got 3.75 mil. And again, if he walks in there to Michigan and next year they're in the Elite Eight or whatever, he's going to rework that deal and he'll be up over four, four and a half, whatever it may be. But that's what I found interesting is Dusty May was a hot commodity and nobody money whipped him that we know of. And so, like, all the Louisville people or even the Vanderbilt people, you know, Vanderbilt, you have big SEC money. What do you spend it on? Not the football team. You have this big SEC contract. Aren't they good at baseball? They're very good at baseball. But, I mean, if you you want a Dusty May and you're U of L or Vanderbilt, why don't you go offer the guy $6 million then? I mean, what's it to you? I mean, this is what the money is for so you can buy coaches, buy players, and buy out coaches when they inevitably don't live up to uh, to what you thought. So uh, it's also funny that for months it was rumored that he would go to Ohio State. That didn't happen. He ends up going to Michigan, but I, I think it's a pretty good hire. And doesn't Dusty May feel very opposite of what they had with Juwan Howard? You always say you want to hire the opposite of what you just fired. Right, yeah, it feels that way, but I just don't understand. If you're U of L or Vanderbilt and you got all this money, I mean, U of L's been, I mean, they, they pay Rick Patino six, seven, eight million dollars all these years. Chris Mack was making over four mil. Go offer him a $5.2 million deal in an eight, in an eight year deal. I don't understand it if you liked him. You got a couple names for U of L now? Uh, now they have, now they're like, Okay, so they didn't want Will Wade because Will Wade is a cheater. I love Will Wade, but he was a you know he strong ass offer and everything else. There's a thought they might be circling the wagons back to him. If not, I mean Shaheen Holloway at Scene Hall. Uh, is it Pat Kelsey who is at Charleston? Yeah, he's got the crazy son. I, I mean, on the bench. yeah, but I mean, you went from Scott Drew and Dusty May and guys like that. You thought you were big game hunting, and you're going to end up with Pat Kelsey. Yeah, they ain't going to fly. <laughs> that ain't going to fly, brother. And, and Pat I Kelsey. thought like Pat Forty might have had this early on. Didn't they throw out the name of Josh Shirts early on? 
Yeah, I mean, we talked about it on this show. I thought I thought Josh I mean, Shirts would be if, if a higher name on their you're list. Throwing out there, are you going to double back on it? I, I don't think it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't taken any job now. He's still going right now. They're still playing in the NIT. But I do wonder if you're Josh Shirts, you want to win in the NIT, but also you want to, you know, you, you want other teams to know you're <laughs> also very interested in their job. You want to start which to could see be that a huge money hit the old bank well, account. Yeah, here. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who they're going to get. I really don't. Tomorrow night, 9 o'clock, again, Indiana State in the Elite Eight of the NIT. All right, plenty more on the bracket and Purdue in what was a surgical performance yesterday inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. We will do that on the other side. Rob Blackman, voice of the Boilers in 20. Maintaining your furnace or air conditioner. Uh, I had, had a buddy of mine listening uh, who's actually in the southern Indiana area. He told me right now the conversation around there is I think Josh Schertz is very much at the top of the list. I told you that I told you that a few weeks ago, and then that all went away with the Dusty May stuff. So uh, we'll see what happens there. It's still uh, quite, the, um, quite the carousel still to go. Is his name – what's the Drake coach who just went to West Virginia – De- oh, De yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that who it was? Tucker, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Tucker. So, they, so they're so they going as a package deal 
to uh, to um, to West Virginia. Is that a cool father son moment for you? <laughs> <laughs> they go from Drake in a mid major to West Virginia. I mean, it's kind of cool, is it not? Well, I just unless you're honest, a Drake fan. Honestly, anytime people bring up West Virginia basketball, I just think to myself, what's Kevin Pitsnoggle doing these days? He's a he's a high school assistant principal. Is there a baby Pitsnoggle? That's the father son that I, I really care about. If I'm going to be Corbin, honest do you know who Pitsnoggle is? You need to look this guy up. He's right up your alley. Yeah, no one. He, he had like the uh, mustache. He played at West Virginia. Corbin needs to rock the Mike Gansey undershirt. <laughs> he really does. That was he a really triple does. X Gansey was rocking there. Uh, I wanted to bring this up, but we'll keep the Purdue stuff going. Obviously, Pacers last night, losers there uh, in LA. Rob Blackman, voice of Purdue basketball, going to join us coming up here in about 20 minutes. I wanted your thoughts, and we'll talk a lot more. More Colts tomorrow as we'll get what Shane Steichen at the at the NFL meetings today. I think Chris Ballard, you mentioned, was going to be speaking tomorrow. Plus, uh, the NFL is going to have some rule changes. What is it? The hip tackle, they call it. That's going to be outlawed. Maybe some changes to the uh, kickoff policy and everything else. So we'll dive into that. What was your reaction on Friday night when Legereus Sneed goes uh, of course, to a team, not the Colts, and of course, to a team right here in the AFC South with the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, I was a little surprised at the asking price, just the third rounder, and then what, a flop of seventh round picks, I believe, was the asking price there. Obviously, you got the contract on top of that, uh, $19 million annually over four years. Um, I view the Colts offseason at this point as a missed opportunity, and I... I hmm. I hope the baseball analogy will land. I don't know if it will, Andy, but opening day is coming up, right, on Thursday? Um, basically, yes, it is. The Colts are in a position right now with Anthony Richardson, as pretty much every other team in the AFC South is, considering their rookie contract quarterback. They're in a position where you walk to the plate and you've got no strikes on you. Other teams have a couple strikes. And by that, I mean you can swing at some pitches that might not be whatever, in the zone or, you know, ah, no, I really need to sit here and, you know, try to foul a few off. Like, you know, other teams, they have to be very selective. The Colts or the Texans or the Jags or the Titans, they don't need to be as selective. You're in a position now where you can take some risks, and it's a small window. It only lasts for a couple off seasons before all of a sudden you want your quarterback to hit, and that means you're going to have to pay him a crazy amount of money and your ability to try and take some of those swings it looks a lot different. And so right now, that's how I view it. And I'm not just talking about Legeria Sneed. I'm talking about the offseason as a whole when it looks like at this point it's team run it back, it's Minshew for Flacco, and it's you added a nose tackle from the Dolphins who won't start for you. I mean, that's what it is right now. We'll see about corner and safety because you still have the ability to make a couple moves. But for any big splash, that has largely come and gone. And I view that as a missed opportunity for a team that, again, is in a unique position, given Anthony Richardson's contract, to do things differently, they're just opting not to. Yeah, you know, we've always, I think the last cup, I think the last week or so, KB, I think we've been fair, and you've even mentioned, hey, there's still room out there to make a sizable swing at this, and it just doesn't feel like that's going to happen. Now, there are still quality players out there. I mean, Justin Simmons is still out there. You could, I mean, at this point, you're probably looking at what one year deals, two year deals. Some of these older players like a Xavier Howard, maybe you bring him in and he's on a one year type of prove it deal, a guy in his thirties. But you know, what I saw watching all this NCAA tournament stuff over the weekend is Colts fans, quite frankly, I think Colts fans are pissed off. I mean, I, th- I I think Purdue fans are or Purdue fans. I don't think Colts fans are happy at all. I think they're unhappy that they didn't get this guy, and he goes, of course, to someone in the AFC South. They have seen the Texans surpass them, and now you know they're probably a little bit worried. Hey, are the Titans putting together? you know, a team that is going to rival ours, you know, after you thought, okay, now we've kind of passed them. They have a new coaching staff. Vrabel's finally out of the AFC South and everything else. So I think there's that. And then the other side of this, and we'll dive into more of this tomorrow, is, I mean, essentially, essentially you gave, I mean, all they got was a third round pick. And so this thought process that the Chiefs were holding out, and it's like, oh, they want a first or they want a second or all this nonsense, in the end, that didn't end up being true. 
They swapped seventh rounders, did the Chiefs and Titans, and then they got a third. And we talked about this before the show. I, I think, you know, I think is it Jeff Howe who's on the athletic? Yes. They, uh-huh. they, they, he gave them, he gave the Chiefs an F on this trade, an F. And the reason he did so was, you know, if they lost Sneed next year to free agency, they would get a third round compensatory pick. And so the Chiefs, did they really want a third rounder so much this year, more so than waiting around next year? That's what Kansas City said. We want the third rounder now instead of a third rounder next year. And this year, they could have played with LeJarius Sneed under, uh, you know, that franchise tag and making over $19 million, but he would have been on Kansas City's team. The flip side is Kansas City feels like with what they have and through the draft, they've been able to nail that position, find corners. Uh, but, you know, and, and who can who can argue with Kansas City for what they've done? But, you know, to me, it was questionable on the Colts and Titans side. Okay, you're not giving up anything. It's also questionable that the Chiefs just would rather have a third rounder this year instead of next year and not play with their all-star corner. I, I yeah, don't know. And I just want to go to sleep at night and think we've gone, if I'm Chris Bout, I want to go to sleep at night and I want to think we've gone above and beyond support for our young QB. Above and beyond. Maybe, maybe you've done too much. But you know what? That's better than doing too little. And I don't feel like you've done that at all. Uh, you know, Nick points out here, it seems to be every offseason the theme is a missed opportunity with the Colts. Where I would argue against that, Nick, is just that, again, this offseason is different. Like, financially, right. it, go back to Chris Boward's comments two and a half months ago. How do things change with Anthony Richardson as your franchise QB? Chris is direct quote, it opens the world up a little bit financially, which is a good thing. He said that then, but they've operated in a very normal sense of just r- team run it back, without this, you know, hey, there's a chance here to throw in a draft pick there. Or maybe you don't re-sign one of the big names um, that are in-house. Maybe you go out there and you get whatever, a B or C level player, and you try to go to a premium position and make a splash there. Because, again, that is my argument. It really has always been my argument in the Ballard era. Look at the top 10 highest paid Colts. They're not at the premium positions. And that's where I looked at the Sneed move and thought, this is a premium position. This is a position you haven't found an answer at right. in probably a decade. And that's the opportunity to try and take a swing. When, again, you can get away with the pitch in the dirt that you've swung at. You have zero strikes on you. You don't have two strikes in the bottom of the ninth. And that's where I view it as a missed opportunity. I'll be curious to hear Ballard's comments when he does well, speak down there at the owner's I mean, meeting. you mentioned Snead. I don't feel like – I mean, I don't feel like they've – you, you want to feel like in the offseason that you're better – I don't feel that way. And that's not against Kenny Moore or Grover Stewart. That's probably, for the golf analogy, shooting par. And that would be unfair. And no, Ball- all of it is and, internal growth. Yeah, B- Ballard would, would kick back that, well, I mean, Kenny's for his position and Grover for what they mean. And I understand I understand that. To me, that's shooting par. What other items are you bringing me that are going to make us better? And I don't feel like they've done that at in the secondary whatsoever. That was a bugaboo last year. And and listen, I know there's still free agents out there. I know the draft is so freaking deep at wide receiver. And then you throw in a guy like Brock Bowers, who very well could be there at 15. I also feel like there's weapons around Anthony Richardson other than re-signing Michael Pittman. But we always knew Michael Pittman was going to play at least this year with the Colts, right? I mean, you always knew it, whether it's going to be the franchise tag or a three or four year deal. You knew he was going to be on the roster. We'll get more into this tomorrow. But again, to me, I've always viewed corner safety as that is the veteran pathway versus the rookie path. You, you you went youth at those areas last year and you got burned so I view it as yes is it a nice cornerback draft sure but again expecting those guys to walk in day one and be stable for you for 17 games is a bit far-fetched when your quarterback schedule is much more difficult that's where I would disagree with the plan of attack here for the Colts voice of the boilers Rob Blackman in 10 Tired of breathing in poor quality air at your workplace? APG Air, the region's indoor air quality expert, has the solution for you. Introducing the most...
Coming up in about five minutes, voice of Purdue, voice of the Boilers, Rob Blackman will join us here coming up on the program. You know, I'm putting together a list, KB, of where I was most wrong this weekend on just everything bracket-wise. I think for you, you were most wrong on Auburn, Auburn right? Auburn probably the final four. Yeah, <laughs> that would be that really I, understandable. Out. I had him winning a few games as well. Where I think I was most wrong, and it's probably, you're thinking, Andy, this team's a six seed. What are you talking about? I think I am as stunned, like even more so than NC State being the 11, I am stunned that Clemson is in the Sweet 16. I don't mind saying it. I am stunned that Clemson and they like wanted to give the way the game away uh, last night, but that was impressive I, though. They I, were in control g- really throughout. Hey, good for them. If you just said, "Hey, Clemson is going to be in the Sweet 16," I would have scoffed at that. Probably more so than McNeese State or James Madison. Honestly, I don't sleep on the ACC now. And Notre Dame did beat. Um, Clemson this year. Yeah, DJ Burns, that's been kind of a fun story with NC State. Again, tomorrow we'll have Jaden Taylor on uh, the Perry Meridian product, Butler transfer. Um, I think NC State's like third leading scorer this year. He's going to join us coming up on the show tomorrow. So, yeah, from a local angle, we don't really have a ton left in the tournament there, but that is certainly one of the items to keep an eye on. Again, four ACC teams, three Big East You'll go two out of the Big Ten, SEC, and Big 12. Uh, and then the Pac-12 West Coast Conference with Gonzaga, Mountain West with San Diego State. One each if Purdue makes the Final Four or Illinois. It'll be the first time since 2019 that a Big Ten team has made it to the Final Four. Speaking of that, voice of the Boilers, Rob Blackman. He joins us next. The Ride with
fan. Good weekend for Purdue. We keep it going. Wake up call live from the drivehuber.com studios. KB and Andy, we have Corbin here. Is Mark Dighton in Florida again? Like the third time this year. That guy needs to be paying taxes. <laughs> I thought he said he was stopping at another bachelor party for his Oh, New bro- Orleans. Didn't he say that as well? Yeah. So, Corbin, when you're waking up, know that Mark Dykes might be at a bachelor party in New Orleans uh, at least a day or two. Sounds so, good like for hell. him. That sounds great, man. I don't know what you're talking about. That sounds like a great time. Yeah, waking maybe up Monday, hell. Well, going to it or, or, or waking up Monday morning? Going boy, to it's a different thing. Boy, you ain't wrong. Uh, let's keep the Purdue conversation going. Uh, good weekend for the Boilers, obviously. Uh, it's going to be Friday night there. Uh, cannot wait in Detroit. Should be a fun one against the Zags. Rob Blackman joining us, voice of the Boilers. He's joined us the last few weeks. And, boy, we sure, uh, Rob, appreciate you joining us early on this Monday morning. Morning. There's so much to choose from, especially from yesterday's game. What impressed you the most with what Purdue was able to accomplish this weekend? Uh, yeah, good morning, Andy and KB. And you're right, there is a lot to talk about uh, in a short amount of time. <clears throat> Probably none more important than what Bart, Mark Dykton might be doing in New Orleans right now. <laughs> yeah, good for him. Uh, but. Yeah, hey, look, of all the things that uh, I suppose if I had to pick one or two that really were the highlights of the weekend, uh, the fact that Purdue's uh, quote-unquote role players played at such a high level, uh, starting with, excuse me, starting with Trey Kaufman-Wren, you know, the 18 points and eight rebounds yesterday, but more importantly, the fact that he scored the first eight points of the game. I mean, we, we came out of that first media timeout, and I said something on the on the radio to the effect of, you know, if you, if I would have told you, hey, at the first media timeout, one of Purdue's bigs would have eight points, including two and ones, and would have been fouled three times already by the opposition, you obviously would have guessed Zach Eady. And it was not Zach Eady, obviously. It was Ray Kaufman Wren. And that followed up, you know, his 11-point, seven-rebound game against Grambling on Friday. And all 11 of those points coming in the second half, if I remember correctly. So the fact that he uh, just took his game to an absolutely – new level uh, in that NCAA tournament first and second round uh, was pretty fun to watch. And it's a guy averaging six points a game. It's not like he hasn't had his moments. You know, I think back to that game against Illinois uh, in early January at Mackey arena, where that was a game where he carried Purdue with 23 points in that game. But, you know, for the most part, and obviously it's been Zach Eady in the low post that's been doing all the damage for Purdue this year, but man, to see Trey compliment Zach the way he did, and then the other, the uh, as far as you know, guys that would also be on that list, Camden, Heidi, and Miles Colvin. I mean, holy cow, what a punch in the arm they're providing right now as freshmen uh, coming off the bench. Uh, you know, Cam is a guy that I think he had ten points in that game yesterday against Utah State. But you know, he was a guy that he just kind of slowly watched his progression this season. Uh, he had a really good first game. Uh, he had you know at thirteen, he had thirteen points in his first ever college game against Samford. And then kind of found himself in that role where most freshmen do, where you're coming off the bench and some games you play three minutes, some games you play ten. Uh, sometimes you don't even get in the game, like in a, in a half. And the same for Miles Colvin. You know, there's a stretch in January where, you know, outside of a, you know, he had a nice game against Michigan where I think he had nine points or something. Outside of that, you know, there's a lot of games in January. Miles never took off the warmups. I mean, he never got in the game. And now all of a sudden he's playing about 13 minutes a game in the NCAA tournament and and really doing some good things. I mean, not necessarily scoring the ball, which he's more than capable of doing, but uh, you know, he didn't score against Grambling, and I think maybe he had eight or nine yesterday. But just the, his added athleticism on the defensive end, especially the perimeter guarding guys and, and his ability to rebound, and he's long. And, and again, his, his overall athleticism that him and Cam bring to this team, which is desperately needed, so those are the two areas, those three guys in those two areas, I thought was probably, uh, as a Purdue fan, what encourages encourages me the most moving forward. You know what you're going to get from Zach Eady. You know what you're getting from Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, Lance Jones. But those other guys can be, you know, a bit of a wild card. And uh, they, they were not wild cards this weekend. <laughs> they were they were big-time players, man. So uh, as a Purdue fan, I, I am hoping that continues. Yeah, a little late season wrinkle there from a rotation standpoint for Matt Painter. Certainly more skill, more athletic with uh, Colvin and, and Heidi getting a little bit more consistent run here, especially uh, Colvin. 
Uh, Rob Blackman, voice of the Boilers, joining us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Rob, one other note, I guess, kind of on that and like, okay, what was the most impressive aspect to the weekend? You know, it, you almost forget at one point yesterday, the score's 25-24 Utah State leads and Braden Smith's heading to the bench with two fouls. Yeah, it's like, right, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you just freeze frame that and show Purdue fans Sunday morning, hey, this is going to happen later today. Uh, Purdue fans are going to be like, can I go to the fridge and grab one more drink? I mean, like that's, that's not like an ideal situation. And for the game to not just be, you know, okay, Purdue weathers that storm and they're up two at half or they're up four at half for them to snowball and build that lead to 16. That to me is just something that I don't know if, you know, there hasn't been a ton of moments without Braden Smith, obviously this season, but that to me is also a pretty encouraging sign of, uh, you handled your quarterback being on the bench and you didn't just handle it, you really thrived instead of just surviving. Yeah, Kevin, uh, I'm with you. We made that same comment uh, at the going to the halftime break uh, because we hadn't, you know, we made that note on our scorecard. At, uh, I think it was like 7.38 or something is where Braden went to the bench with that second foul. And as you said, uh, one-point game at that point. And uh, there have been many times this year when Braden Smith has gone to the bench. Not often. He plays a lot, but... Uh, I shouldn't say many times, but there have been few times this year when he has gone to the bench in foul trouble, and it's just kind of uh, fell apart for Purdue on the offensive end. Uh, it did not fall apart yesterday, as you well mentioned. Purdue pushes that lead out to 16, and I would also add there was a short little stretch there, not not very long, but there was a short stretch uh, late in that first half when both Braden and Zach Eady were on the bench at the same time, uh, and that rarely happens. And when it has happened this year, it has normally gone south quickly on Purdue. So not only Braden on the bench, but again, Zach on the bench. for, And again, it wasn't as long, uh, just a few minutes, uh, really more like a few seconds. But to, for Purdue to add on to that lead and, you know, look, I, I, a lot of credit goes to Lance Jones. Um, you know, he's a guy that uh, when he came to Purdue uh, this summer and started working out with his team and really playing early in the season, he was he was a bit of a, uh, what would we ever use the word wild card? Let's say uncaged animal at times. You weren't quite <laughs> sure what he was going to do. If he was going to make the right decision, especially with a ball in his hands on the offensive end, which is never a good thing when you're the backup point guard. Um, I know he starts at two guard, but when Braden leaves the game, he slides over to the point. But I thought he did a super job of just running the offense, staying within himself, not doing anything crazy just doing what he was supposed to do really shows his level of maturity and his level of understanding about what, what Matt Painter and the coaches want from him now on the offensive end. But yes, I'm, I'm completely with you, Kevin. That was a, that was a stretch there where I, I myself was a little nervous sitting courtside thinking, you know, this, this thing could go south on us quickly here with no Braden Smith in the game. But, but luckily Lance was, uh, was really able to step in there and, and, and get the job done. Rob Blackman with us, voice of the boilers here on the wake up call on the Payless Liquors hotline. Yeah, it was like, it was like to me, the game was like a, ro you know, those roller coasters that go zero to like 80 miles per hour in two seconds. That's almost how it was. It was a close game. It looked like it was going to be a close game. And then boom, it's 16 at halftime. And Rob, you were sitting there, Utah State, I've used this, you know, uh, uh, I don't, it's not even an analogy. It's just my take. They, they broke their soul. They crushed Utah State's soul. I, I mean, that last 25 minutes of that game, that team had nothing. Purdue had totally yeah. wiped them out. Yeah, you know, uh, Andy, when the, uh, Matt Painter likes to use a similar phrase, is, is, is steal their spirit. Can we steal their spirit? And it really felt like Purdue did that. Those first, what, 90 seconds of the second half, I think, if I remember correctly, Utah State took a timeout 90 seconds into the second half because Purdue came out and went on that quick little run. Yeah, Lance uh, that hit included. that three right out yep. of the gate. And then we got a two, and then they shot an air ball, maybe two air balls. I know one air ball from the top of the key and maybe either a turnover or another bad shot, and you could just kind of tell right then uh, that this was going to be Purdue's, uh, Purdue's half. You Because, know, look, you know both coaches at halftime were talking about, hey, the first five minutes of the second half, right, these are going to be crucial. Let's, let's make a statement. That, let's get to that first media timeout of the second half. And we'll make our statement. You, look, I know Purdue said that in the locker room. I'm certain Utah State did as well. And, of course, it didn't go Utah State play. 30, 90 seconds in, they're thinking, well, that's a hell of a statement. Uh, and then it just it snowballed on them. So, uh, yes, look, I, I, Utah State's a much better team than we saw yesterday. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, yeah, that was a Purdue home game. I mean, we might as well be playing that thing at Mackey Arena. 
and so that's tough on those guys. I I looked over at their their little you know the cheering section they have for their fans behind their bench in the second half. There couldn't have been 25 people there. I mean, it just <laughs> it, it was a home game for Purdue, and I get it. You know, you're traveling in from Logan, Utah. Uh, there just aren't a lot of folks who are going to come to to do that. So, uh, it, it, so I do I do give credit to the Purdue fans for certainly selling out the building and and making it very pro Purdue. And I also credit Purdue basketball because they earned that right. I mean, it didn't, the NCAA, when they're doing the tournament brackets, they don't just hand those things out randomly. I mean, if you earn the opportunity to play close to home, then you earn that opportunity. So it was just, it was going to be a tough day for Utah State no matter what. Uh, but it, but you add on to the fact that Purdue played at the level that they did yesterday. I mean, that, that made it nearly impossible for those guys. He is voice of the Boilers, Rob Blackman. He's with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Kind of on that point, Rob, I don't expect it to be the same like it was this weekend. But, I mean, I I would assume Purdue fans have been knowing Detroit is the location for the last month plus now for the Sweet 16 Elite Eight. Uh, Any guess to what that percentage could look like come Friday night, maybe even Sunday afternoon for Purdue up in Detroit? Yeah, yeah, no, good question. I I don't, you know, I don't, I'm like you. I don't think it'll be certainly quite as Purdue heavy as it was this weekend in Indianapolis, but I do certainly think it's still going to be uh, leaning toward the Purdue, uh, Purdue side of things when it comes to fans in the stands for the, for the very reason that you just mentioned. I mean, I think everyone that follows college basketball is kind of known for the last month, if not two months that Purdue is going to be going Indianapolis, Detroit. Uh, they were going to be right. the number one right. seed in the Midwest. I don't know that there was ever any confusion about that. So yes, if you're a proactive Purdue fan, you most certainly would have, purchase your tickets for Detroit by now you you wouldn't have waited until until last night to to make that purchase so yeah I don't you know again I don't I'm I'm not sure how many Purdue fans will be in the building but I I I certainly believe it's going to be pro Purdue and again and Matt Painter has emphasized this Purdue has earned that right I mean when you when you go 29 and 4 you you earn the right to to play close to home and be a number one seed so uh, if you're going to go through all the trouble of earning that that you know, that distinct advantage of playing close to home, then you you probably need to try to take advantage of it. And Purdue certainly took advantage of it this weekend. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It's kind of why I've said, you know, it's fine to celebrate, you know, Maui, celebrate winning the Big Ten title by multiple games. Hell, celebrate this. Because, yeah, to your point, Rob, they've earned this. By doing what they did in Maui, by winning the Big Ten, being as dominant as they were, you know, all those top 20 wins over teams away from home, that's given them this path. Not everybody has this path. And, and, and they have this path coming up again. It'll be Gonzaga Friday night, 739. It was a long, long time ago. The weather was certainly very different than it is right now. Uh, <laughs> Gonzaga did have a halftime lead for what it's worth. Both teams shot it terrible from three in that mm-hmm. opening round game in Maui. Uh, Purdue was very impressive in the second half. Fletcher Lawyer really struggled. Uh, Zach Eady was Zach Eady in that game. Any memories, Rob Blackman, from four and a, I, I can barely remember my kids' names. Any memories from four and a half months ago in Maui? I remember sitting on Waikiki Beach pretty much every <laughs> afternoon. I sipping a few. Another my time. time. <laughs> Good yeah, for you. I haven't, I haven't forgotten that part. What I do, I, I really don't remember a lot about that game. Uh, I'm like you. I, I pulled out the stats from that game earlier this morning just to uh, try to sound a little bit like I knew what I was talking about when I visited with you guys. <laughs> but the, the, now that I've looked at, this, looked at the stat sheet, the one thing I do remember is that was a poorly played game on both sides. Uh, that was not a game that if you're a fan of basketball and, and you, have, you had no rooting interest, that you might have turned that game off at halftime. It, you mentioned both teams shot it poorly. Gonzaga was 18% from three. We were 23% from three. We had 13 turnovers. Gonzaga had 14 turnovers. And, yeah, other than Zach Eady kind of being doing Zach Eady things in the second half, there was not a whole lot to be really interested in if you're a fan. You know, Ryan Nebhard, who I would argue is, and many would argue, is obviously their best player. He, he was one of nine shooting. I mean, he, he, and you mentioned Fletcher Lawyer. He did not shoot the ball well for Purdue. Hell, no one for Purdue shot the ball well. It just wasn't a cleanly played game. It was, aesthetically, it was not pleasing. Now, obviously, if you're on the side of the team that wins, you kind of forget about that part. You know, you just saw oh, it was a great game. We, no, it really wasn't. There was nothing great about that game at all, quite frankly. So uh, I will be interested to see, you know, how this thing shakes out Friday night. Uh, I know assistant coach uh, Paul Lusk, he joined us on the post-game radio show, and he talked about how, you know, they're, they're a lot they're a different-looking team now. They, they're playing a bigger lineup. Uh, 
uh, Ben Gregg, who's one of their you know six six ten six eleven guys. He was playing off the bench when we saw them back in November. They now start him, so they really go big across the front line, like six ten six eleven seven foot which is going to be a problem for Purdue on the defensive end, right? You know, who's, who's Fletcher Lawyer going to guard? You know, last I checked, he's 6'4". Uh, so they, they've gone to a bigger lineup, and it's really obviously it's paid dividends for them. Heck, here they are on the Sweet 16. Um, but it's, it's – I would say to the fans that, that remember that game better than I do, I, I don't think Friday's game is going to resemble anything like we saw back in November. I just – again, that game was not very well played by either team – and Gonzaga is playing in a lot different style than they were playing back then. So I don't know that that game in November is going to have a whole lot of bearing on, on what's going to happen this Friday night. Rob, when do you guys head up? I assume open practice again on Thursday. Is it Wednesday bus up or fly up or what? Uh, uh, it is Wednesday that we are heading up. Now, I think, and I have not uh, talked to our operations folks yet this morning, but so the last time we were in Detroit, oh gosh, 20. 18, maybe 16. I can't remember. Anyway, we did have to bus. Uh, that was the infamous hook and hold game uh, against Cal State Fullerton uh, in which Isaac Haas was injured. And then uh, Purdue would beat Butler in the next round uh, to move to the Sweet 16, whenever that was. Uh, but anyway, I do remember when we went up to Detroit, uh, Purdue had to bus that one because you're within the, whatever it is, the 300 mile radius or whatever right, it is. Right, right, right. You have the bus. So, uh, I'm assuming we're busing, but I do not know that yet. I haven't gotten those details yet. So coming up 739 Friday night, 31 wins for the Boilermakers, most in program history, and yesterday just absolutely surgical in advancing to the Sweet 16. Rob, I've enjoyed these Monday conversations, if we could, and two wins happen this weekend. We'd love to pencil you in again a week from Monday. Uh, congrats on what has happened so far. I've enjoyed the calls and uh, looking forward to uh, hopefully chatting again coming up in a week. You bet, KB and uh, Andy. Thank you guys for having me. And, yes, if we have a chance to talk next uh, next Monday, I'm probably going to be in a really good mood. <laughs> I would say <laughs> yes, so. And yes, pack sir. in a few warmer clothes out there for Phoenix. <laughs> Rob, thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, guys. Voice of the Boilers, Rob Blackman right there. Yeah, two two things. I think you mentioned this. So since what mid January, Gonzaga has only lost to St. Mary's. Now, again, their conference is terrible. I mean, the conference it does schedule include a win at it, Kentucky. It, it, it does, uh, which that was big. You know, Kentucky at that point was teetering, but they ended up being a three seed and the top twenty five team and everything else. So, uh, you know, it's been a pretty good couple months for Gonzaga. Now, Gonzaga usually can get right, if you will, during their conference tournament, uh, but still a five seed. And then just, you know, looking at it all the way back, what, four months ago or whatever it is. I mean, it is kind of funny. These two teams played in an ugly game in a high school type gym. <laughs> now they're going to be playing the second matchup, KB, in an NBA gym with the rights to go to the Elite Eight and be 40 minutes away from the freaking Final Four. Uh, it is interesting, the uh, the journey of a college basketball season. And I think most of our audience heard that last name of Ryan Nemhard, and yes, that is Andrew Nemhard's brother. He is a transfer from Creighton. Uh, they added Graham E.K., transfer from Wyoming. IU fans might remember that name from the play-in game against Trace Jackson Davis and company a few years ago. It's a Creighton team that – or, excuse me, it's a Gonzaga team, Andy, that if you look at it, I mean, it's Sweet 16 galore. And, I mean, the faces change, and they just show up. They show up on the second weekend every single year. They have shot the basketball much better as of late. They were not a good shooting team for large stretches – this season, I think Nemhard's a really good point guard. He had 12 assists, I think it was, on Saturday against Kansas. So that will certainly be a matchup. And then if you look ahead to Creighton, Tennessee, again, Purdue played Tennessee in Maui earlier this year. Kind of an ugly game, foul trouble, probably dominated a lot of it. Fletcher Lawyer bounced back and was terrific in that second game in Maui. And if it's Creighton, I, I, I almost forget this, Andy. I mean, Creighton was one shot away from being in the Final Four last year Yeah, against San Diego State. I, I was at that game. That was a great game. Heartbroken so, Creighton fans. Men weeping in the stands. I mean, when you talk about it, these are teams that, like, when they all sat there in their preseason meetings, they all thought they would be playing this coming weekend. And oh, honestly, without a doubt. Yeah. Major aspirations to be in Phoenix coming up here in a little over a week there. So, um, that again, 739 coming up on Friday night.
from, what do they call that, Little Caesars Arena, is that uh, right? Yeah, I think that's it. You know, mentioning Creighton, they had, oh, and I'm and I'm blanking on the other player's name. They had, if you remember, Baylor Shireman. Oh, he is who, skilled, man. Who cut his hair. He cut his Ooh. hair off, though. He had, the, he had the long, flowing hair. That was an unbelievable finish the other night <laughs> between chopped, them and Oregon. He chopped his hair off. You know, he... He was thinking about going pro. If you remember, Baylor Shireman, it, I don't want to say a little bit like Zach Eady. I think Zach Eady would have went before him. They're different positions and everything else. But you talk about older teams, guys coming back. You know, they had Shireman come back and then Kulk Brenner, who's the seven-footer, uh, who is a senior this year for Creighton. He came back as well. Uh, so it was just it's just interesting. You know, Purdue kept their team together. They improved from within, and now maybe they do have a couple freshmen who are going to give them some big-time minutes down the stretch, and they're in this spot. Creighton did a very similar thing. They kept their own. They're in this spot. Tennessee had to go out and get a guy like Dalton Connect. They had to go get a guy that could score for them. You know, they've always been that tough physical team, but at some point you got to have a couple more guys that can go get you in bucket, and they did that. I'm excited for Detroit. This is... This is a powerhouse two games that we're going to see on on Friday night. It really is. Don't know if it rings the same as it did this time last year from the reverse of it, but on this day last year, Purdue fans had to live in the humiliation of IU fans (laughs) finding their cube (laughs) early in the morning. Don't even turn on the computer. Don't even log into your email. You go find the Purdue fan first, and you let them know what happened on Friday night to Fairleigh Dickinson. If Purdue fans want to return the favor on this Monday morning, again, I don't know if it rings the same, but it is five sweet 16s in the last seven tourneys. Andy to find five sweet 16s for the IU men's program. Yeah, well, I know Tom Crean had two of them. You've got to go back 30 years to find five. So I was nine years old. You were what, four? Corbin wasn't around? Corbin, what year were you born? Yeah, what year were, were you born? Good days of 1999. Oh, my gosh. Well, right before Y2K, he, baby. He was five it raised years all the computer systems. From Four even months. being born there. <laughs> Four so. months from Y2K. There you, there you go. Purdue fans, you can celebrate in a little bit of that here, but obviously they want much more than that, and they want to be off to Phoenix coming up here in a little over a week. We'll continue to try and get you the Purdue fan-centric guest all week long. I do want to make sure we tease this. Early in the week, Andy, coming up on Thursday, the great Rick Venturi is going to join us. You know, Thursday is the 40th year anniversary of send the Mayflowers to bring the Colts to their new home. Certainly quite a uh, infamous story there. Rick Venturi was in the thick of it as a young assistant. Oh, I'm sure he was. Then Baltimore Colts staff. I caught up with him briefly last week. Oh, I can't wait for this, by the his way. His storytelling, I know all of our listeners know this, is, is outstanding, so... I can't wait for that. And you know what? We'll, we'll sneak in a few present-day Colts-related <laughs> topics as well. Let's just say he's got some opinions. I, I was about to say, I'm sure. I'm on sure, how the offseason has operated yeah, so I'm sure far. Colts fans uh, kind of know where we're going with this. We'll go I'm sure he does. Yeah. With Coach coming up. I'm sure he does. On Thursday. So we'll continue the Purdue combo, of course, all week long. But coming up 730 and 8 on Thursday morning, we will uh, bring you Rick Venturi unfiltered per usual. Then, all right, pop quiz in about 10. Before we get to that, so let's hit a morning check down. The morning check down brought to you by the Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament. Elevate the game at the inaugural WBIT coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse April 1st and 3rd. Yeah, let's start with Purdue because I want to get you this Zach Eady sound. Again, just dominant over the Aggies of Utah State. 106-67, your final last night. KB, you mentioned, you know, kind of puffing your chest out to Indiana fans. Purdue fans can do that today, but they want more. Matt Painter said it after the game. Zach Eady and others said it after the game. I'm sure the fans feel the same way. Let's just keep winning. Let's get to Phoenix and the Final Four. Post game, Zach Eady was asked that very question. What else does the team want to accomplish? Here's what he had to say. It's no satisfaction. Um, I don't think anybody on this team, um, like I didn't come back to make the Sweet 16. Um, I came back to make a run, like a deep run. Um, nobody's satisfied with where we are now. Everybody wants to keep pushing. We're going to keep taking care of our bodies, keep uh, executing, focus on this game plan, and prepare for Gonzaga. Yeah, the Zags are up next. They're the five seed right now in the Midwest. You'll catch that game Friday night, 739. The estimated tip off there on TBS in Detroit. Favorite Sweet 16 matchup that you're looking forward to Thursday? 
or Friday. Again, a lot of chalk. It's the ones and twos all through to the Sweet 16, just the third time since 1995. Uh, let's see here. If you made me choose one on I know Thursday, you've already bitched and moaned about Illinois Iowa State at ten. Well, I'm just not going to be able to stay up that late. You know, we got to be crisp in here when we come in uh, in the morning. Oh, I would say on Thursday it's Alabama North Carolina. God, Mark Sears is just. I that, saw someone say he's Jalen Brunson. That's such a great description. Yeah, the game that that game. I hopefully is just back and forth. I mean, those teams want to get up. They want to run. Uh, both have a big. That should be interesting. I would – boy, I tell you, Friday to me is the difficult one. Like, I got to be honest, I'm going to cop out. I want to see all these games. Like, I could see NC State advance to the Elite Eight. Purdue and Gonzaga should be a very good game. Houston Duke should be a very good game. I mean, Tennessee Creighton, I wouldn't be surprised if that game came down to the last second. I, you just, I just gave us nine games. Listen, those are the four <laughs> games I want to see. If you're going to pin me down on one game, give me uh, give me Tennessee Creighton. We'll go Duke-Houston. Okay. You know, just what do we see when – I love when teams see Houston for the first time and just kind of handle everything Kelvin Sampson throws at you. And you know what? This time last year, Andy, we just totally wrote off Alabama's opponents and just like, oh, yeah, Alabama's good. They're going to make the Final Four. They were probably the biggest favorite in the Sweet 16 round. Right. You look at it right now. UConn, the biggest favorite. Who do they got? San Diego State, the team that did bounce Alabama last year. Could they do that for a second year in a row? <laughs> All right, tonight it is. It's ten thirty tonight, right? From it, it, it crypto, is whatever yeah. the hell it's, it's called a, now. It's the a Staples Center. It's a late one. Yeah, it's so ten thirty. Final back to back of the season for the Pacers. We know where they rank in back to backs this season. It has been ugly. Granted, they didn't have to get on an airplane for this one. Uh, it's in L.A. for back to back games. Uh, Forty and thirty two on the year. Of the Pacers last night they lose one fifty one forty five. Rick Carlisle was vehemently upset about the officiating. Afterwards, huge second and third quarters from the Lakers. Andy, I think what honestly is a bit of a bummer to last night, I checked out at the end of the third quarter thinking the game was over. It turned into kind of a competitive fourth quarter, and it almost is like wasted energy on the back-to-back. Well, like, it's not a bad point. When I yeah. went to bed at the end of the third, I I'm know. like, you know what? Okay, they're going to lose, but at least they won't have to play their starters in the fourth quarter. They did. Uh, they cut it to three on a couple of different occasions in the fourth, but couldn't get over the hump there. Uh, so, again, the Pacers lose to the Lakers last night. We'll see about Aaron Neesmith. He got banged up on a hit from Cam Reddish, stayed in the game, but you never know how a guy's going to react on that, uh, you know, on a back-to-back to that. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell the issue. He got hit in the sternum, I but then, his, then yeah. his head snapped back, and it looked like his, you know, his head hit the floor. So, was there a neck injury, yeah. a head injury, a sternum slash chest injury? He's striking injury. a pretty tough individual. Um, and again, stayed in the game, so that'll be something to just keep an eye on for tonight. So, the Pacers 2-1 and one on this road trip. They did win in Golden State on Friday, uh, but they will round things out here um, coming up. Tonight in L.A., Wednesday in Chicago, clinging to that sixth spot in the Eastern Conference. Can I throw one more thing out? We haven't talked too much about this. I thought the Golden State game uh, on, what was that, Friday night, I thought we got a little bit more of Tyrese Halliburton that we kind of saw earlier in the year. Now, he shot 50% from three in that game on Friday from three. He was four of eight. It's the first time he shot over 50% from three. I mean, you got to go all the way back to that Toronto game before the All-Star break. That would have been February 14th is the last time he shot over 50% from three. And then maybe you could say he reverted, didn't really have, you know, a big game, didn't hit those threes until the very end, right? That made it kind of a close game. But I was interested. I thought if you'd have told me that, and I know he had 10 assists, that they would score 145 points against the Lakers last night and Halliburton would only have 12 points, only hit two threes, I would have, you know, I would have been surprised. So I guess that would be my only thing. I was just a little, besides the defense, and Carlisle called three timeouts at least last night where he was not happy. I kind of was hoping to see Halliburton build on what he did on Friday night against Golden State, which, by the way, was a very good win. He had a sequence of, like, banking in a three, which didn't go in, banked in and out, like, off in the right wing, and then an air ball a few possessions later last night. So, um, yeah, did not string that together from Friday. A couple other items to note here. Indiana State moving on to the Elite Eight of the NIT. They are in full control over Minnesota. Uh, Yesterday afternoon, Ryan Conwell, the Pike product, 
outstanding in that one. IU women trying to move into the Sweet 16 today. They've got Oklahoma in that 4-5 matchup at Assembly Hall. That is a 6-30 tip. This is the round where IU bowed out at home last year in the tournament. And you'll see some NFL news trickle out throughout the day. Owners meetings taking place down in Florida for that. Uh, and Dusty May to Michigan. So we have seen the openings in the Big Ten and Ohio State and Michigan get filled. Is that it, you think, from a Big Ten standpoint? Yeah, I, I think I so. Guess Washington are, technically are, is a Big Ten team. Are Indiana fans are upset at that? Or how upset at that are they? Did he, is did there a coach clause you like? for IU? I ask that in all seriousness. <laughs> I doubt there is. Like, IU fans look at it and they're like, oh, perfect. He'll get like a two-year run in, yeah. in the Big Ten and, you know, get used to the conference. And then he'll come down here. I'm thinking, I mean, if you're Michigan, don't you – put some sort of or try to have some sort of well yeah i mean i'm sure he has a buyout again this I mean, this guy you specific for the clause boy, don't we see that on occasion I, I i would be stunned if that was the case uh michigan's a really good job indiana fans need to wake up to where they are a little bit in college in college basketball no, you just started a michigan new topic. well louisville fans have figured out the same thing here in the last five or six years exactly where they are right now by the way i had a buddy text me josh shirts is absolutely his name being brought up right now back at louisville 100 percent. he's he's probably besides and get this besides gotcha. will if besides you're, will Louis, wade, you're like oh gosh yeah besides will wade those are probably the two names they're talking about this morning will wade and josh shirts josh shirts has played this pretty well just continue to coach your team yep. handshake no, agreement with not, st louis not say anything yeah yeah I'm not calling it josh mcdaniels but you know it's just he, he, he him and his agent <laughs> are playing the game right how, how much is he making roughly at indiana I state thought it was 330 ish thousand and then st louis just Fired Travis Ford for a couple mil and two, over two million. Yeah, and, and, and Louisville, if he ever did take that job, he would make at least three and a half. If Dusty not, was if just not even, three, right? Yeah, Dusty if not, I, I think you'd probably be between three and a half and four. So if you're Josh Shirts, potentially you could go from about three hundred and fifty k a year to about three point seven five per year. Not bad. Pop quiz time is next. Three one seven two three nine ten seventy for that. Give us a call. Go to 1075thefan.com and register to win Golden Gloves amateur boxing tickets at the Tyndall Armory for six...
Sharpen your pencils. It's time for the Pop Quiz with KB and Andy. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube, Indiana's favorite oil change since 1985. All right, Pop Quiz. By the way, KB's working the phones right now. We got a pretty good week of guests coming up, right? Yeah, I think we've got some... Uh, you you want to let... I mean... Yeah, I think, uh, I think we're going to have... we got uh, some former Purdue players. Uh, the legend that is Brian Cardinal, who now yeah. calls Central Indiana home. And the he's janitor. Be joining us later this week. Carson Cunningham, of course, great point guard, and wrote an awesome piece on the Boilers on Golden Black and just really the history of their program and Gene Cady and Matt Painter specifically. And they're going to join us. So we'll continue it, Andy. Purdue-centric guest, one a day. Uh, throughout this tournament run, so we will continue that throughout the week. And like we said, Rick Venturi going to join us later in the week as well. All right, I'm going to let you choose the caller. Where do you want to go here? Uh, Pop quiz time. Boy, Purdue was fast fingers all day yesterday. Uh, who we got, Corbin? Oh, uh, Let's go with Will. Will. Will the thrill. Good hey, morning, Will. Will Berg. Didn't he score for Purdue late in the game yesterday, right? Hey, Will. <laughs> Good morning, fellas. How are you? Will, are you a Purdue fan? Yeah, I'm a Purdue fan. Yeah. You said that a little reluctantly, if I must if I must critique Well, I it. went to school at Ball State, uh, but I was a, a Purdue fan growing up as a youngster. Everett Stevens, Todd Lewis, sure. Troy Lewis, rather. Um, some of those guys I followed. Now, did I see Andy Peyton Sparks yeah. back to Ball State? Yeah, he said, run it back. I'm back. So yeah. That's the old transfer <laughs> up and then transfer back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good for well, Michael Lewis, well, I guess. I mean, yeah, one place he was getting 30 some odd minutes a game and the other, you know, the other spot he wasn't. He's getting three minutes a game. Good for him. All right. Uh, well, thank you for calling and uh, sure. good luck on the pop quiz. All right. Well, let's get a let's get a winner here. Question number one. The Pacers lost to the Lakers 150, 145 late last night. Who was the leading scorer in the game? Was it Miles Turner, Anthony Davis, LeBron James or how about this? Two of the above. Boy, can you repeat the question? The leading scorer? Yeah, who is the leading scorer last night, Pacers and Lakers? Turner, Davis, LeBron, or two of the above? Two of the above. I like that. Good start. Good start. Question number two. All right. Uh, men's basketball tournament gone pretty much to chalk, by the way. And I think that was Siakam, by the way. But nonetheless, he got it right. Uh, moving on to number two here. Uh, can you name the only double-digit seed left, Will? North Carolina State, Oregon, Grand Canyon, James Madison. Uh, North Carolina State. Question number three. All of the one seeds, all of the two seeds, and two of the three seeds are alive in the men's basketball tournament. Name the three seed that did not make it out of mm. the first round. Baylor, Kentucky, Auburn, or St. Mary's? Baylor. All right, number four here, Will. Carlos Sainz, that would be Ferrari's Car Carlos Sainz, won Formula F1's Australian Grand Prix over the weekend. Sainz missed the Grand Prix in Saudi Arabia two weeks ago. Why was he out of that race? Was it COVID? Was it a broken hand, a travel visa problem, or appendicitis? What a question. I, I know. <laughs> I, I, I apologize up front. Uh, I'm going to say a travel visa. Day after the tournament, uh, after you know the first week of the tournament, we're asking F one questions. Well, I didn't. Here. I thought only one guy was allowed to win in F one. Yeah, we're stopping. Thought, yeah. Someone else wins. Or, uh, what a Maybe race! He had COVID. Yeah. Did he have COVID? Yeah. Did he have a broken hand? Anyway, last one. On this day in 1972, John Wooden's UCLA Bruins won their sixth straight NCAA tournament championship. Who did the Bruins beat in the 1972 title game? Was it Memphis State? Villanova, Florida State, Kentucky. Uh, Memphis State. Oh, Florida State. Florida State. There you go. All right, Will. Not a bad uh, job, Yeah, Will. number three disappointed me. Uh, three and four <laughs> were the two hiccups. Four beyond understandable. It was appendicitis for Carlos Sainz. But number three, come That's, on. It's your calling card. Yeah, your Who? calling card was Oakland over Kentucky. Come on, Will. Oakland over Kentucky. <laughs> Baylor then lost in round two. Will, thank you for the call. All right, we'll round it out here one final time. Jefferson Shreve stepped up to fight when no one else would. He put it all on.
All right, so we're back at it here, hanging out with you. DriveHuber.com studios, KB and Andy, wake up call. We have Corbin hanging out with us this week. I don't know, Corbin, if you're ever happy. You're usually the late night uh, the, the late night guy, so now you're the early morning guy. By the way, we're vamping here. KB's going to pick up Darren Andrews from We Grow Hair Indy. We're going to get an update. I never really get to see the scalp of one Kevin Bowen because he's always got a hat on at 7.05 in the morning, so we're we're going to do some unveiling today. You can go to their website again, We Grow Hair Indy. Uh, we've done a lot today, obviously. Purdue basketball, the big winner uh, over the weekend. You know, I'm coming up with uh, kind of where I was most surprised this weekend. Not surprised uh, by what happened with Purdue. Probably most surprised with what happened to Auburn. Clemson as a six seed as well so we have a lot to talk about we're already filling out the guest appearances this week kb is back go ahead man what's going yes. on yes um yeah surprises on that end uh if, if i can be selfish for just a second i would have liked a few more little buzzer beater drama there you had to stay up late on saturday and sunday really to get both of that with creighton and oregon and then on sunday uh last night with houston and texas a&m but uh now in studio a uh, big fan of the Butler Bulldogs. He would be Darren Andrews from We Grow Hair. Indy is in studio with us. Darren, uh, how's the bracket looking? Uh, not too bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've got Houston going all the way. There we go. That so, was a quite the finish last night. It I don't was. Know if you stayed up for that one. Happy to, to get through that one, so we'll see. Uh, again, see. coming up this weekend, it'll be Purdue Gonzaga, 739 on Friday night. Uh, Darren, I was up there with you guys, uh, what, about a week and a half ago for my yeah. four-month checkup, yeah. the Artist yeah. Robotic FUE procedure. I took off the hat for the final segment of the show. Apologize <laughs> for the lack of a shower on this uh, Monday morning. <laughs> um, but I continue to be very pleased with the results, and thankfully your professional eyes agreed with that. Yeah, so uh, four months post-transplant, so that new hair just starting to come in. At this stage, normally about 50% of the growth is starting to come in. So, again, on that VIP page of yours at We Grow Hindi, we're going to have that video up there shortly. and some pictures to sort of track that progress. And what's really nice about it is it's very gradual. So it's not like you wake up one morning, suddenly all the hair is there. A lot of guys come in for that four-month follow-up, which is part of the 12-month follow-up process. And they're like, I think it's starting to grow. Mm -hmm. And as you right, know, you right. look at the before picture and you're like, wow, that was me. I, I was in awe looking at the before picture. I was like, wow, it really looked right. like that. Right. And now it looks like this. The other thing that I, I have said on, you know, throughout our, our mornings here, um, I cannot believe how, I guess seamless is the word that pops in my head or just, you know, how smooth the recovery process was. You know, I had the procedure done on a Friday yep. and I was trying to think ahead because the Colts are going to have a bye week that right. following week. The Colts played that Sunday morning in Germany yep. and they're going to have a bye week. I'm like, man, there's going to be a lot of recovery with this. Sure. And I was like watching that Colts game. I'm like, this is a breeze. And right. then I was back at work on Monday and I don't want to act like for everybody sure. necessarily it's going to be as smooth as it was for me. But that was one of my biggest concerns entering it. And to have, again, as, as really seamless of a, a recovery process, I was really pleased. Yeah, I think that's a big concern for a lot of guys. And, and look, it's medicine. Everybody's different. Um, I remember back when I had my procedure in 2005, uh, another guy had his procedure with me the same day. I remember calling him that evening. He was great. I had a very light-grade headache. I had a multi-unit yeah. hair grafting procedure. It was nothing. It couldn't be managed. And that's just, it's like going to the dentist. You can have different experiences every time. But, you know, the technology now, the care of the follow-up, we've got it down pretty good. So we try to minimize those variables as much as possible. And a little bit of planning around your schedule and what you've got coming up, like we did with you, you can work through those things. It's never going to be completely seamless, but we've got it down pretty good now. And he is the clinic director, Darren Andrews, at We Grow Hair Indy. Uh, we Grow Hair Indy .com is a website, 317 522 2995 is the phone number. I'm watching some of these coaches this weekend. I'm thinking they could use We Grow Hair Indy. Yeah, me not, too. To get, not, you know, <laughs> not to get too too personally, or maybe even some you know, locally on that and there. Um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, you and I talked about this. I was initially a little hesitant. You know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, I mean, I'm not like naked up top sure. it's not you know uh, a a glaring glaring issue but you reminded me let's think like five to ten right. years down the road and let's think a little bit further i think people my age i'm 34 that's probably a good reminder to have as yeah well. i was 32 when i had it done so you know i've had one procedure and that global approach that we talk about of keeping what you've got so doing different modalities to maintain the hair that's not transplanted and then you replace what you've lost with the transplant here and everybody's different so you had a deep receding in the front and it's not about making you look like you're 15 again it's sure. about giving you an age specific look so it looks good now but also as you continue to age so 
just keeping a little bit of natural receding, but not as deep as what it was, and transplanting up into that really strong hair to kind of allow for any future loss of what's not transplanted. So we're playing the long game in that regard. And that's super important. That's where experience and expertise and knowledge is really important and not just giving you something that's going to look good short term. You've got to think long term. Andy, I was thinking maybe that uh, that goalkey kid. Dude, oh yeah. Okay, I, I was. Were you I, thinking that too? I, I, uh. I was thinking, what? How do I interject myself into <laughs> this conversation on Kevin Bowen's beautiful hair now? And I was thinking, what about goalkey and his what, Wolverine what did you call hair? Him? He looked like the Wolverine. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's what he looked uh -huh. like. Yeah, like uh, kind uh. of Steve Alford offspring, but not yeah. totally Steve Alford offspring uh. is what we were thinking there. The sharpshooter for Oakland, of course, yep. as Oakland was our Cinderella there. That. Unfortunately, bowed out Saturday <laughs> That's night. That's so funny. As yeah. they cannot get a shot <laughs> off at the end of regulation against NC State. One other thing that I don't know if I've brought up too much on air, but I've had these conversations, Darren, with people that have had different sorts of hair transplant procedures done. Uh, let's just say out of state, even out of country. Hell, I know some people that have traveled to different continents right. for it. And the results let's just say have not gone according to plan. Right. And it's been you know, quite the culture shock, I would say, from a recovery process and from a general four-month look or you know, even further down the road. Obviously, I'm biased, but I just think right here in our own market, we've got the gold standard, which right. I've said often about We Grow Hair Indy. Yeah, I think what's happened a little bit worldwide is hair transplants have been commoditized. And I think the medical relevance of how and why and what and is it right for you it's not right for everybody so there are certain places you can go and get a hair transplant and whether you're a candidate or not because you want one they'll give it to you so i think that's something we have to be very careful of again talking about what we talked about last time uh, with that long-term approach some guys need another procedure at some point so the donor area in the back you only have so much of it so making sure that whatever is done now is in your best interest long term and unfortunately it's not always the case Look, there are some good procedures being done elsewhere. Of course there are. But there's also some really bad ones and sometimes maybe some short-term sort of maybe not over, maybe not thinking things through properly and getting something done too quickly can have repercussions down the road. So well, those are all things when we do the free private evaluation we talk about. Um, again, maybe a transplant's not right for someone right off the bat. So you take a different route. And I think that knowledge and understanding and experience is super important. Again, he's the clinic director at We Grow Hair Indy. He is Darren Andrews. Andy Sweeney, you want to take a guess at one coach that is still alive in the tournament that Darren Andrews, uh, let's just say he's not the biggest fan of? <laughs> oh, someone you're not the biggest fan no, of? No, no, no. Oh, goodness. Now, Darren is a uh, diehard boy, Butler is... fan. I'm a Bulldogs fan. Okay. Now, this oh, is a goodness. guy that had some post-game comments yesterday acting, I cannot believe the disrespect of the committee and how they treated us <laughs> with our region. and with uh, the Hurley? Hurley? Hurley. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. I just, yeah. <laughs> Not my favorite. It's just the way you carry, you, you know, I think you carry yourself a certain way. And when you're the top dog, I mean, I think you have an opportunity to, to, to sort of put something out there that's positive And I don't know. Yeah, so maybe, oh, it's a, I, maybe it's a love to no, hate I, thing, right? I, I think I think that's it. He, there's he, some fire there. Yeah, there's he's some nuts, and his brother's nuts he, too. He, he, they, he likes to play when there's drama. Right. Does that make sense? I think he. Yep. I think he is. You know, John Calipari is a he little bit like that. Yeah, they, yeah. They, if it's if the drama's not there, they're going to create the he drama. In that. Exactly. Yep. That's yep. how they operate. He feeds off it. Darren, yep. one more time again. We grow hair indie.com, The phone number three one seven five two two twenty nine ninety five. And like you said. Free evaluation awaits. Yeah, that free private evaluation, either virtually or in person. Uh, that's the first step. See what we can do for you and see what options we have. Cannot be more pleased with how the results have gone. Again, four months for myself here as I show the old camera on the YouTube chat and uh, from a recovery process as smooth as it could be. Darren, thank you so much for thank coming you. in, man. Pleasure. Thank uh, you. Just one quick uh, bit of news. I'm seeing this first from Jeff Goodman. Maybe someone locally has put this out there. Uh, IUPUI is hiring Paul Casero. So that being announced within the last couple minutes. Uh, Paul, we got to have on this week. Go. We've obviously had him on. The pride of UND, the pride of Roncalli. Paul Casaro getting the IUPUI job. That makes complete sense from a get a footprint back into the city of Indianapolis. So congrats to Paul on that. Everybody have a great Monday. We'll continue the Purdue flavor all week long. Congrats to the Boilers moving on to the Sweet 16. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan.